three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Live, he's nationwide on CBS Sports Radio. This is the Zach Gelb Show. Here's your host, Zach Gelb. From the place are yet not overly ostentatious studios of CBS Sports Radio here in beautiful New York City, sitting on top of the 10th floor of 345 Hudson Street. Welcome on in to a Wednesday edition of the Zach Gelb Show across all the great local CBS Sports Radio affiliates, Sirius XM, Channel 158, the free Odyssey app, and of course streaming live on YouTube, youtube.com slash CBS Sports Radio. 855-212-4CBS is the number to jump on in. 855-212-4227. You could always get at me on Instagram, where I'm straight flexing, or via the good old cesspool of Twitter, at Zach Gelb. I got Ryan Botcher. I got Moist Mike. Everyone's rocking and rolling with me all the way up until 6 p.m. Eastern, 3 p.m. Pacific. We have a loaded guest list today. Coming up 40 minutes from now, a little college football fix with the head coach at Utah. In Kyle Whittingham, joining us live on the show at the top of the hour will be Seth Greenberg to break down all the madness that's going to be upon us starting tomorrow in March Madness. And then the final hour of the show at 5.20 p.m. Eastern, 2.20 p.m. Pacific, 
We'll be joined by the head coach of the Auburn Tigers in Bruce Pearl, who's going to be stopping by. His squad just won the SEC tournament, and now they are off to the West Coast, Spokane, Washington, where they'll do battle as a four seed up against number 13 Yale, and that game will commence Friday afternoon. I got to start off with a little audio. I don't know why this guy is making the rounds. I don't know why people are taking him seriously. And quite frankly, I don't know why anybody gives a rat's ass with what he says. But here we are responding to something that the brother of Dak Prescott is saying. I'll play you the audio in just a second. But the drama Dallas choking Cowboys are really the offseason gift that just keep on giving. It's wild. From CD's uh, Lambs family members to Micah Parsons family members and then Dak Prescott's family members. I've never talked about on this show about more family members. And I don't like to talk about family members because I think it's awkward and I think it's weird. But I've never talked about more family members than family members of the Dallas Cowboys. Because they just don't shut up since the season ended. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. There is no way that if I was the star quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. After just having an embarrassing finish to to my season. That I would allow my brother to not only talk about me. But continuously talk about me. Take shots at the front office of the people that write my paycheck. Which he did last week. And he said, oh, the Eagles have the best uh, front office in football. How about them, Cowboys? And now he's taking a shot. Tad Prescott, who I'm going to start calling Turd Prescott, he's taking a shot at Jalen Hurts, which is a little backwards because if you're praising the Eagles' front office and saying Howie Roseman is the best general manager in football and they have the preeminent front office in football, you would think then Turd Prescott would also be giving his endorsement to Jalen Hurts. But uh, Turd Prescott was on the I Am Athlete podcast, and he was asked about his top 10 quarterbacks, and he decided to take a shot at Jalen Hurts and also pump up his brother. Let's listen up to Turd Prescott. Pat Mahomes, Dak Prescott, Lamar Jackson, Josh Allen. I still hold Aaron Rodgers as the top five quarterback. Joe Burrow. Jalen Hurts? You said quarterbacks, not running backs. Aye, aye, aye. <laughs> <laughs> Who was up yeah, there? Oh, Still right hold there, Matt bro. Stafford up there. Jared Goff has definitely come up in my ranks. That's nine. Matt Stafford. I would actually put Goff above Stafford. And then 10. I, I don't know if I have a 10th guy. I really don't. Maybe maybe Flacco. I thought he still has a ring in play. You could throw, <laughs> throw Russell Wilson there too, but I, I, I don't know. Turd Prescott is a clown. Now, it's a funny line when he said what he said about Jalen Hurts, but that running back did get to a Super Bowl, something your brother can only dream about. That running back has won an NFC championship game. That's something only your brother can dream about. And also, you can't avoid, like, if you're going to have that material, and that is planned out by Turd Prescott, you need to be able to have your top 10 list ready to go because at the end and we condense the clip but when you're doing the humming a humming a humming a humming a game and you can't name a 10th quarterback and trust me I love Joe Flacco Joe Flacco came on this show we did nearly a million views by saying he doesn't deserve to win comeback player of the year but to name Joe Flacco and that's the name that you could pull out of your ass to get to 10 it's just ridiculous but like this whole sequence and this entire clip from Turd Prescott just once again is the Cowboys offseason in a nutshell. This was supposed to be a Cowboys offseason where they were all in. And instead of being all in and bringing in the best players possible, the family members have been all in just making the culture and making the fan base and just talking about the team in, quite frankly, a jackassery way. Now, I'll at least credit that we haven't heard much from Micah Parsons' family after the season ended. We haven't heard much from CeeDee Lamb's family right after the season ended. Like, you get that week grace period. 
But Turd Prescott now is clearly just saying things to get a reaction and to keep him uh, his name in the news and just keep on basically grabbing the coattails of his brother and trying to ride them to some fame. So I probably should be above this. I probably shouldn't bring it up, but it's just so tone deaf by him. And you start to wonder if he really does have the best interest of his brother. And it goes back to a conversation that we had the other week, Samter, where I think Dak is just immune to all the, the circus that surrounds the Cowboys. And even, quite frankly, that goes on with his brother, where he knows that there's noise here. And we sit here and we go, oh, my goodness gracious, how about this noise? And is it a distraction? I don't think Dak is phased by it anymore. Maybe earlier in life he was, but now there's no way he's phased by it. So in one breath, I am actually respecting Dak Prescott because of the way he's able to block it out. But I wouldn't be cool with my family member, my brother, my actual brother, going on a podcast, taking a shot at Jalen Hurts, and once again, just continuing the never-ending news cycle of Dak's name being in the news, and it's really nothing that Dak has done. Like, when Dak doesn't play well in a postseason game, I understand why his name is in the news. But we should not be talking about Dak Prescott on the 20th day of March in the year of 2024. But, Samter, here we are where Turd Prescott is just taking his brother's name and he's, even though he's trying to say he's the second best quarterback, he's basically dragging it through the mud because this doesn't get reported as Tad Prescott says this because no one would know who the heck that is. It's Dak uh, Dak Prescott's brother takes a shot at Eagle star quarterback Jalen Hurts and basically calls him a running back. And it's just, it's a bunch of nonsense. First of all, what's the deal with the uh, three-letter name Prescott family, Tad and Dak? All right, it's it's you know that's the first thing I, I yeah. think of. It's just the the names are interesting. It's like Dak, Ted. They seem very similar, but yeah, I mean, if I'm Dak, I come out first of all. I privately tell my brother, "Shut the hell up." But he won't. But you have to. But he won't. I agree with you. But he won't. But you should. And you know what? Even if he does, not that I know Turd Prescott well, but just the way that I think I know him, I think even if Dak says, "Hey, shut the heck up," he's not going to stop. He's going to keep on doing this because clearly this guy is trying to grow his following and he loves to just comment on everything. And he takes the low hanging fruit going after Jalen hurts, going after the front office because he knows that it keeps his name relevant. I I get it. I get what he's doing, but you're not wrong. It's like, you know, I'm not directly comparing him to Jackson Mahomes, but, and Jackson Mahomes had like serious things right going on off the field. But there was a moment when we said about Patrick Mahomes, like, you eventually got to just tell your brother to shut the heck up and, like, stop. But it doesn't mean that the brother is going to end up stopping because once you get a little taste of that fame, you keep on trying to bathe in the fame and the, and the spotlight and, and and all that. But to get to Turd Prescott's point, and you know what? Let me be professional here since we are on the national radio network. Let me get to Dak Prescott's brother's point. I won't even call him Tad. Um... Dak, a top 10 quarterback? Dak, the second best quarterback in the league? Not on my list. I know Dak played like a top five quarterback this past season, but he's never able to consistently bottle that up and then carry it over the next year when you're looking at Dak consistently in that top five conversation. Like just for starters right now, if I'm giving you my top 10 list, Mahomes is obviously on it. I'm talking about guys before Dak. Joe Burrow, Josh Allen, Two-time MVP, Lamar Jackson. C.J. Stroud with what he did in year number one. I was blown away with what C.J. Stroud did. Aaron Rodgers coming back from the Achilles. Heck, I have more confidence in Matthew Stafford and Jalen Hurts entering this season than Dak Prescott and Justin Herbert and Brock Purdy. Like, right there, those are 10 guys. And you could argue maybe a few of them on the back end, like Herbert and Purdy, But those are 10 guys that I think are all better and will all be better in 2024 than Dak Prescott is. And there's an argument on where you could place Dak, but I would take Tua over Dak entering next season. Heck, I would even take Kirk Cousins coming off the Achilles 
over Dak Prescott entering next season. Like, that to me, it's a wide range. I think he falls anywhere from like eight on the on the high end. And then if you want to bottom out, it's probably like 14. You know, he's in that range where there are moments. It's kind of like he's better than Derek Carr. Don't get me wrong. But there are moments where like Derek Carr years ago would look like he's about to break through and he was going to be like a top five, top six, top seven guy. And then anytime you start to come around on Derek Carr, which I did not. But anytime people would start to really praise Derek Carr and Derek Carr's name would be in the news and it'd be like, ooh, and ah, here's Derek Carr. He's about to be the franchise quarterback face plant. And Dak is a good quarterback. I'm not saying Dak is trash. I'm not saying Dak is garbage. Dak is a good quarterback, a very good quarterback. But I could give you 10 quarterbacks and make the case that they're better than Dak Prescott. Now, I'm not going to crush Dak's brother for putting him at two. It's a family member. But it's the arrogance to take a shot at another quarterback in division, in conference, and basically say that guy is not a quarterback when that quarterback in one season, just one season, had a better season than your brother has ever had, where it was regular season success and combined with postseason success. And let me just remind everyone, I know they lost the game, and I know last year the Eagles were 10-1, and and then they projectile vomited down the stretch. There was a Super Bowl, even though the Eagles lost, where Jalen Hurts was the best player on the field. And that was a Super Bowl that featured Patrick Mahomes in the game as well. So... Dak Prescott's brother can make all these jokes and keep on talking and keep on keeping his name in the news. But the quarterback he took a shot at in less time has accomplished more than his brother, who he believes is the second best quarterback in football. So here we go again, Santa. Death, taxes, and the Cowboys who haven't played a football game in months. They're still in the news because it's not, it's like, It'd be one thing if Jerry Jones did something. It'd be one thing if C.D. Lamb did something. It'd be one thing uh, if Micah Parsons did something or Dak even did something. But ever since losing that playoff game, when we've talked about the Cowboys, okay, when Micah came on this show and made his comments about T.J. Watt, but that didn't really have to do anything with the Cowboys. Micah and Demarcus Lawrence having that little fracture in the locker room and a difference of belief on why they weren't ready for the playoff game. But outside of that, it's been... CD's family taking shots at Dak. Dak's brother taking shots at the front office and then other quarterbacks in the NFL. And even Micah Parsons' brother was going after it as well. Like, do we have to get everyone on like a Dr. Phil episode or like a, what, what's the, what was the show? Uh, Mar? No, no. Uh, the late, great uh, Jerry Springer? Like, do we have to get everyone on the show and get all the family members on and kind of have a therapy session? Yeah, more was more the Are You the Father stuff. Yeah. But yeah, Jerry Springer. Here's the one thing I will say. We look at Dak, and we always remember the playoff failures. Sure. Right? And it's hard not to look at a quarterback when it comes to the playoffs. That's how we judge quarterbacks, Mm -hmm. right? Stats, wins, and championships and playoff success. And sometimes, I'll let you finish, but sometimes the conversation in the postseason is a little premature and sometimes unfair. I don't think it is for Dak in this case, though. Sure. Now, let's just say this. Over the last three years, Dak is 31-14, and 14, completing 68% of his passes and averaging 36 touchdowns a year over the last three years. Okay. Okay. I understand that we judge him based on his failures in the postseason. But those numbers right there are top five quarterbacks numbers right there. Those those wins... And this is why Bill Belichick says stats are for losers. Because you could have numbers... I'm not judging like, it based on stats. Wait, wait but hold on. You fully. could have numbers that suggests that you're a top five quarterback, but then when you actually watch the game, I don't ever consistently say over the last three years that Dak Prescott is a top five quarterback. Is it possible that because of Jerry Jones, because of the Cowboy brand, because of America's team and the expectations of the Cowboy quarterback, that we're a little bit harsher on our judgment and our criticism of Dak than we are with other quarterbacks Here's why who would be no. doing the same thing in Miami or Detroit or... Atlanta. Here's why I will say no, because there is a quarterback that is now in Atlanta, but he was in Minnesota in Kirk Cousins that gets, I'm not going to say gets dragged through the mud as much as Dak Prescott, 
But a lot of way, a lot of ways that people talk about Dak is the same way that people talk about Kirk Cousins. Phenomenal regular season quarterback, but doesn't get the job done in the postseason. And when I watch football, I think Kirk, even with his postseason struggles and Dak with his postseason struggles, I would slightly prefer Kirk over Dak Prescott if I had a quarterback for this just upcoming season. So you could have numbers and I could spin an argument and someone could be a top five, top 10 player. But then when you look at it, it's like you never feel like they're a top 10 player or a top five player, like just top five quarterbacks. And I don't think you believe Dak is a top five quarterback. I know you're throwing at the stats, but Mahomes has to be on there. Burrow has to be on there. And Josh Allen has to be on there. Like, I don't think any of those are are close to, to debating. And I think you have to put Lamar on there now. Two that, that was going to be the next thing. You have to put, like, those four, I think, are the top four. And after four, there's the discussion. But now, I think those four have to be the four. Now, hold on. You mentioned Lamar. Lamar doesn't play for the Cowboys. And Lamar receives just as much criticism for his postseason failures, if not more than Dak does. Because Lamar has also had more regular season sex, uh, success. That was a little tongue twister. <laughs> he probably has, to be honest. Let's yeah. Be, let's be real. But he's had more regular season success. And he's had two MVPs. So it, it goes around there. That reminds me of a moment when uh, I was interviewing Brett Brown. He's like, oh, we're all starving for sex. And he meant to say success in a press conference when he was the coach of the Sixers. But those four guys, right away, I think you can't even have the argument and the potential argument. And with Jalen Hurts having regular season success and postseason success, he has to be on that list before Dak Prescott. And you know what? I think C.J. Stroud, Aaron Rodgers, like I'm just talking about guys in front of, of Dak. And then you have a guy like Matthew Stafford, who maybe is like still the most underappreciated quarterback, where he's always had good regular season numbers. And this was a guy that won a Super Bowl his first year with – being in an actual competent organization. So I think there's like seven or eight names right away that I have to put in front of Dak. And I could easily, as I have, given you 10 names that I'd rather have over Dak Prescott. Anyway, this is Zach Gelb show on CBS Sports Radio. Where do you rank Dak Prescott? Are you, are you having, excuse me, have you had enough with his brother? I'm all worked up here right out of the gate. 855-212-4CBS. Kyle Whittingham going to join us coming up 20 minutes from now. But when we return, Virginia, maybe you should have slept through their first game of the NCAA tournament in the playing game because that was embarrassing. I have one thought, and I want to see the selection committee really pay for putting Virginia in, and I think this could continue even though they're done in the NCAA tournament. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remain. Four minutes remaining. minutes 30 seconds remaining Three minutes remaining. Two 
two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Now back to the Zach Gelb Show. I saw a tweet last night as you did have Virginia just embarrass themselves against Colorado State, where we all know that Virginia at halftime only had 14 points. And this isn't like revisionist history where now today everyone's like, see, Virginia shouldn't have been in the tourney. But this was the last three days or two days, Monday and Tuesday, ever since selection Sunday did happen, carrying over to Monday and Tuesday, every single person, Bobby Regan was on this show and he said he could name at least six teams that should have got into the tourney. If not more than that, than Virginia. So sometimes usually when the committee puts in a team that people don't think belongs, they always find a way to exceed expectations and win that first game. But Virginia last night didn't even have a pulse. And Ben Stevens put out a great tweet to document this. Virginia scored its 14th point of the game at the 9.20 mark of the first half. That was at 9.48 p.m. Eastern time. Virginia next scored its 16th point at the 16.40 mark of the second half. That was at 10.40 p.m. Eastern. That is 52 minutes of real time between Virginia points. That's crazy. And that was as lethargic, putrid, disgraceful of a performance that I can remember in a long time. Like, it's one thing when you get upset and you lose a game, right? Like, we saw uh, Princeton last year as a 15 beat Arizona. It's like, why didn't Arizona go more into the paint? But when you literally have no life and you could only find a way to muster up 14 points, you don't belong. And I don't want to disregard Indiana State. I don't want to disregard Pitt because you got screwed with Virginia getting in. But really, I hope this is the NCAA tournament that we look back and we go Big East power. 
Like, we look back at the Big East and we say, the Big East really flexed their muscles, and the Big East really told the committee to go pound sand. And the three teams that can do that are the only three Big East teams that are in. In UConn, in Marquette, and in Creighton. Because there's no way that a team like Seton Hall, Providence, or St. John's wouldn't have given a better effort if they were extended an invite into that playing game last night. And they all would have been superior than Virginia. And I don't care that Providence lost in the NIT. You know, it's tough to get up for a tournament that you didn't think you should be in. St. John said they're not going to the NIT. And Seton Hall had 13 wins in the Big East. But that was my biggest gripe with the selection committee is that UConn's the number one overall seed. Marquette, who looks like they're getting Kolek back, is a two seed. And then Creighton is a three seed. I understand bids were stolen, but you can't tell me that not one other Big East school didn't belong. It just doesn't make sense to me. So I'm glad, not not that I root against Virginia, but I'm glad Virginia embarrassed the committee last night and made the committee get dragged through the mud in the last 24 hours or so, or less than 24 hours or so. And I hope the Big East schools can kind of form together and UConn is the team to beat. Like, if UConn does not win a championship, right, it's disappointing. But they just won it the year ago. Uh, you have a look at Marquette. They're in a tough region. They're an intriguing region. You have Houston there. You have Kentucky. I think Kentucky's going to go to the Final Four. But you look at Marquette, there's no reason why they couldn't get to the Final Four, especially if Kolek's back and he's playing the way that he can. And then you have the biggest question mark region, which is Midwest, which you don't trust Purdue. You don't trust Tennessee, even though Dalton Connect is sensational. Kansas' is best player and their leading scorer, it's announced he's now done for the tournament and he's not going to participate in the tournament. And then Creighton has a lot of guys that they returned from last year, but it's okay. Can you put it all together? And then Gonzaga's still there. Like, there's a lot of teams that you just don't trust. So I want to see Marquette, Creighton, and UConn go as far as they possibly can and continue to give the middle finger to the selection committee to try to support the schools that should have got in if you want to make an argument for a St. John's, a Senior Hall, a Providence, and for them to put Virginia in over those three schools, and you could also throw Pitt, and you could also throw Indiana State, it's just an absolute disgrace, and the committee got what they deserve. Having Virginia, because if Virginia were lost the game by four points, and it was like 63-60, no one's talking about them today. But the fact that they put up an embarrassing 14 points at half, like I usually wouldn't say, oh, like I could put up more points, but I think my youth league team... When I was in 10th or 9th grade and we went undefeated and I had a triple-double in points, rebounds, and elbows or hard screens, I think we could have put up 14 points. Like, ridiculous. 14 points. You could have told me that last night that Virginia only put up 14 points at half. I would have never believed it. 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227. We opened the show talking about Dak Prescott's brother saying that Dak is the second best quarterback in the league and Jalen Hurts isn't even a quarterback. He's a running back and he's not a top 10 QB, which is just a joke. We got some reaction on the phones. Let's hit them up. We go to Adrian and Marilyn next up on the Zach Gelb show on CBS Sports Radio. Yo, Adrian, what's shaking? Yo, Zach, what's shaking? Hey, buddy, I'm I'm not going to say Dak is a a number two quarterback in the league, but you got to say you're lying to yourself if you think Dak doesn't get more scrutinized than any other quarterback in the NFL. Josh, Josh, Lamar Allen, Jackson? Almost in the, Josh Allen's almost in the same boat. Hasn't got to the hasn't got to the Super Bowl. Hasn't won a Super Bowl. And he doesn't get scrutinized as much as Dak. But he's Lamar, played better playoff Lamar games Jackson. than Dak Prescott has. L- Lamar Jack Lamar Jackson, two MVPs, has not gotten to the Super Bowl. And he gets scrutinized. Has, he gets killed all almost, the time. Has almost the same playoff record as Dak. And he's not scrutinized. Oh, yes, he is. You're, you're wrong on Lamar. You're wrong on Lamar. What's, what's Lamar? Lamar's like, he, what, two and five? Something like that? Yeah, but in the regular season, he plays great. And people always say we he can't get the job the done in the postseason. Season. But that's what I'm saying. I thought we weren't talking about the regular season. Wait, but Adrian, everyone has said for the last three years, and I thought it was premature. The sample size wasn't big enough. Now it is that Lamar can't get the job done in the postseason. That take has been out there for a while now. I understand it, but he doesn't get as scrutinized as Dak does when Dak loses. You, you, How you about after the AFC Championship what? game? Of course he did. He got dragged. 
Zach, Zach, we're in the March Madness, and you're opening up with Dak's brother. I I can't stand the dude myself. He Dak needs to say shut up. But even but what do you what do you want me to leave the show up, with today? March Madness, Virginia. You just talked about Virginia last night. Yeah, but still, and I'm just gonna be honest. Yeah. Why we didn't do Virginia right out of the gate? Because if I have a football topic, football's 365. It, it's it's number one over over any other sport. I, I know it's 365, but like Samter said. He does. Dak does get more scrutinized than any other quarterback in the NFL. It's probably because of Dallas. It's it's because the Dallas name, the the the, the brand. But you cannot. You're a Cowboys you fan, right, Adrian? Not memory. If, 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 are you a Cowboys What's fan? That? Huh? Are you a Cowboys fan? You know, I'm. A, I'm yes, I'm a Cowboys fan. But yeah. I'm not sticking up for him. I'm, I'm just saying. For him being you guys, you guys but, think everyone's trying to come out to get you, and you forget when other people are going after other quarterbacks in this league. There have been other quarterbacks. Are we talking about Lamar? Are we talking yes. about Josh Allen? We have talked about we're not Lamar. Talking about Lamar and Josh Allen, like we're talking about that. Lamar, hundred percent about them. Yeah, because Josh Allen's better. Josh is better. He's been has, better has in Josh the playoffs. Won more, has, has Josh he at least has been than... an AFC championship game. You can't even get to a championship game with that. But we're talking about the Super Bowl, Zach. We're talking about the Super Bowl. Yeah, and when you win more and you still come up short, that doesn't put you number one in the criticism. Like, and... Phillip Rivers got crushed all the time. Now, let's stop making this. There's only a Dak issue. Phillip Rivers got crushed all the time. Let's go to Brian in Pennsylvania next up on CBS Sports Radio. Brian, go ahead. Hey, man, I'm, I, I appreciate you for having me on the show. Um, I just want to say that I'm disgusted by Zach's, uh, Dak's brother, like, just getting on, just, just ranting about frivolous things. Like, your brother's a good quarterback. Let him do what he has to do and just lay low, especially after he just got embarrassed in the playoffs last year. And you want to talk about this guy's number two in the league. Come on now. No, he's incapable of doing that. And he's just trying to get fame and he's trying to get the spotlight on him. And, you know, it's kind of crazy that Dak hasn't told him to shut the bleep up yet. If we're just being fully transparent, it's kind of crazy that he hasn't. It is Zach Gelb show on CBS sports radio. We'll take a time out. Little college football fix coming to you next. Kyle Whittingham, the head coach of the Utah Utes will join us. Seth Greenberg going to join us at the top of the hour and still to come at 5 20 PM Eastern 2 20 PM Pacific Bruce Pearl as Auburn gets set to uh, tip off the NCAA tournament there. First round game is Friday up against Yale. Here's Ack. CBS Sports Radio. Sports Flash. And it's sponsored by Progressive Insurance. Drivers who switch and save with Progressive save nearly $750 on average. Call or click today to find out if they could save you hundreds on your car insurance. The second part of the first four takes place tonight in Dayton, where Grambling and Montana State tip off the doubleheader with the winner facing Purdue Friday. Then a pair of 10 seeds meet in Colorado and Boise State. The Broncos are looking for their first ever tournament win. Head coach Leon Rice said they'll have their hands full with the Buffaloes. Terrific. I mean, they got three guys that are on the NBA draft board. They got a terrific coach, terrific coaching staff, and they're a team that you know, looks like they're playing their best basketball right now. I think they've won eight out of the last nine and and have done it in looking really, really good. Colorado went four, 24 and 10. The Broncos 22 and 10. The winner will meet Florida next. Shohei Otani had quite a Dodger debut. The $700 million man had two hits, an RBI, and a stolen base in LA's 5 2 win over San Diego. NBA tonight, the Celtics go for their seventh straight when they host the Bucks. I'm Richard. You're listening to CBS Sports Radio, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, all live, all the time. CBS Sports Radio.
We miss college football. Milrow stands in. He throws into the end zone. He caught it. It's caught by Isaiah Bond in the corner of the end zone. Touchdown, Alabama. We can't wait for the 2024 season. Hands it off to Edwards, who will bounce it outside. Got him at 40. Got him at 30. Got him at Edwards. He's in the clear. His second touchdown run of the ball game. This time for 46 yards. And Michigan has taken a 13-3 lead on the second touchdown of the night from the man who was not tripping. And we're counting down the days to kick off. Are we there yet? No. Are we there yet? I said no. Are we there yet? What's wrong with your ears? Here is your college football fix. Only on the Zach Gelb Show. 162 days away from the Utah Utes opening up their season against Southern Utah. It is the Zach Gelb Show coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio. Now joining us is the coach of the Utah Utes. He's been their head man since 2005, and that's Coach Kyle Whittingham. Coach, always great to have you on the show. Thanks so much for doing this, and how you been? Doing good, Zach. Uh, just got spring ball underway, and uh, we're uh, hot and heavy into it right now. We had our fourth practice yesterday, and, and uh, so far, so good. You know, I'm curious what your off season was like. I know you've gone through changing conferences before when it was the Mountain West and then you elected to get into the Pac-12 and now you guys are going into the Big 12. When you're changing conferences, how does that alter your, your off season? Just wondering. Yeah, we had some things that, uh, you know, we don't usually do, you know, checking uh, travel times and, you know, where we fly into and, and getting new hotels and all that stuff with, with all the new destinations that we'll be going to and that combined with uh, doing research, obviously, on the new new teams that we'll be playing. You know, we haven't played, uh, uh, you know, the majority of the Big 12 teams with any regularity, and, and so we've got uh, a lot of, uh, you know, scout work that we need to do. Now there is teams, uh, you know, that we're very familiar with, with Arizona, Arizona State, Colorado, and so forth. So, so it's not completely new, but, but uh, there is uh, quite a few new elements to it for us. Well, I know someone that's not new to your program, but now he's back on the field is Cam Rising. I've been seeing a bunch of videos with spring ball underway. Is he a full go? Is he 100% coach? He is. He's full go. Uh, now, obviously, we're going to keep him upright all spring and not uh, not subject him to anything, but but uh, it's great to have him back out there. He's a leader of our football team, and it's just a different feel when he's out there on the field and a different vibe, and, and uh, it's tremendous to have him back uh, out there running the show and and also is uh you know one of his main weapons brant keithy our tight end who's who's uh such a talent and we were missing him last year as well so to get both those guys back out there has been a big plus for us yeah i remember with cam there was moments it, set, it seemed like he was close last year to get him back and playing for you guys and then the announcement came uh, that he was not going to return just how difficult is that knowing your relationship with him and what he means to this program with everything he did go through last year yeah, it was tough uh, during the course of the season, you know, hoping that he would be back and be able to return. And and uh, we got to the point where it was so deep into the season that that uh, you know we started thinking, you know what, let's just preserve the year and and not rush him back. Uh, not that we would have rushed him back any you know under any circumstances, but but just uh, to the point where uh, let's call it let's call it good for this season and and get him ready for the twenty four season. And so. Uh, that was, uh, like I said, a little bit frustrating at times, but, but Cam was doing everything he could possibly do to get ready and get back. And it just wasn't, uh, quite there yet. And, uh, you know, we just followed the medical staff's advice and, and, uh, went the, uh, red shirt route. And, uh, I, I'm hoping that we'll be very, uh, you know, glad that we did that this fall. So physically he's in a good spot. Where is he at though mentally? Cause that's a different component of this when you look at the physical and the mental side too. Yeah, he's uh, in a good place. I mean, he was never uh, out of the mix with his last year mentally. He was out of practice, uh, helping out and and working with the uh, the quarterbacks and and uh, being a part of the team. So he was never removed from the team. But but it was frustrating for him just not being able to be out there. But but uh, you know, as I said, he's back now. He's 100. percent He's moving around. He's throwing the ball well, and uh, he's got uh, absolutely no limitations other than the ones that were self-imposing as a coaching staff. Talking to Kyle Whittingham, his team moving into the Big 12. He's been the head coach of Utah since 2005. He's here with us on the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. You mentioned your tight end and Brant Keithy. We know how special of a player he could be for your program. Also had to miss last year because of injury. Take me through how you found out that he was returning because there was some speculation that maybe his time at Utah was coming to an end. Yeah, Brant's been in the program for uh 
quite a long time, and there was uh, some some discussion, some thoughtfulness on his part as to whether or not uh, he wanted to take the next step and and try to to uh, catch on with an NFL team. But when he uh, considered everything and and weighed uh, the pros and the cons, he decided. Uh, to uh, return for another season. We were elate, elated when he made that decision because I, as a coach, uh, I felt that was in his best interest as well. That was, that was the same, uh, line of thinking that we were, uh, that we had. And, and so he's, uh, you know, coming back and, and much like Cam, he's 100% out there at spring. And, and much like Cam, we're not going to tackle him this spring. I mean, that's something that'll, that we'll wait till fall, but, but, uh, he's a weapon, uh, for us, you know, Obviously, he's got a bunch of balls here, and and he's a team leader, much like Cam. He's one of the captains. In fact, him and Cam were voted team captains uh, about a month ago, and and uh, it's great to have him back. Yeah, I want to ask you about the rest of your team because I'm sure most people all they do is just ask you about Cam and they ask you about Brant because those are the big talking points. You guys have had this thing humming uh, a lot recently at Utah, and you guys have dominated the Pac-12. Now going into the Big 12, some of those Pac-12 teams joining you in the Big 12, and it's shaping up to be a really good conference with all the additions, but what do you want people to know about your team when it's not about Cam, when it's not about Brandon, it's everybody else? Well, first of all, we, we've had a, a pretty good run here. As you mentioned, we've been very consistent uh, through the years, and, and that really is tied to consistent recruiting. Our assistant coaches have done a phenomenal job of targeting the right guys to get into this program that, that fit what we do and fit our mentality, fit our philosophies. And uh, that's really what college football is all about. You know, if you recruit well, you're going to have a chance to be successful. And, and if you don't recruit well, you're going to pay the price. And so I uh, can't say enough good things about our, our staff and how they've gone about their business in uh, recruiting the right athlete to Utah. Uh, we pride ourselves on being a mentally and physically tough team and program. And uh, that's been our calling card for a lot of years. And a uh, physical run game, a uh, physical run defense. And uh, that's really been our formula, and, and uh, it's worked. Now, we obviously got to do a lot better job offensively this year than we did last year. We had one of our four performances offensively last year, but uh, as we talked about getting Cam and Brant back and, and uh, with some of the other weapons we have in place, we hope to, to get the offense uh, humming again this fall. When you look at your future, clearly you love Utah. You, you've had opportunities to leave. You haven't. You've been there since 2005 as the head coach, but the sport's going through – all these changes with conferences, NIL, and the transfer portal. We've seen some coaches that have been around for a long time expedite their retirement process. Do these changes maybe say the end is near for one Kyle Whittingham, or do you still love this as, as much as ever? I love the I love the the, uh, the college game. I love uh, you know what I'm doing. The passion, the energy that I have uh, at work each day is you know is is not changed at all through the years. Uh, I can say that. The new challenge of going to the Big 12 is uh, it's almost like getting a new job. I mean, it's uh, you know a whole different uh, set of opportunities. And, and we, it's much like when we went to, from the Mountain West to the Pac-12, uh, what, about 12, 13 years ago, it was, it was the same feel where, hey, new challenges on the horizon and, and uh, rejuvenation of sorts. But, uh, yeah, NIL is, is uh, certainly put a different spin on things, the transfer portal. But, uh, you know, I know it's, it's – uh, nowhere near resembling what uh, you know you and I grew up with college football wise and it is never going to be the same it'll never get back to what it was but but uh, that's okay with me I mean just you just keep moving and changing and and adapting and uh, I think at some point they'll put uh, some parameters on what's going on particularly in the NIL but for right now you just got to be able to uh, navigate it and and uh, even as, as uh, challenging as it can be, that wouldn't be the primary thing that uh, would drive me into retirement. It's just I'm getting up there, but I still feel like I have a few good years left. And last thing I'll ask you, Coach, as Kyle Whittingham is here with us, I'm going to ask you about some player that you had to go up against quite a bunch the last few years. That's Caleb Williams, whose pro day was today at USC. You just being a defensive-minded coach. I know you guys fared very well up against USC, but you know the talent Caleb Williams is. How do you think his game will translate from college to the NFL? I think he'll be exceptional in the National Football League. He's he's got all the uh, the physical tools that you need to succeed. Um, you know, one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, guy to sack uh, since I've been at Utah. And that's a you know that's a thirty year statement right there. And and uh, just his ability to extend plays, uh, keep his eyes downfield, uh, his arm strength. Uh, I can see no reason why he's not going to be. Uh, 
like I said, very successful and, and be a, a number one quarterback for whoever drafts him right away. 162 days away from the Utes kicking off another season of football up against Southern Utah. He is Coach Kyle Whittingham. Coach, good luck on the change into the Big 12 and uh, good health to your program this year. Appreciate that, Zach. Thank you very much, and thanks for having me on. There he is, Coach Kyle Whittingham, joining us on the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. It's time to ask the pros, where you, the listener, gets to ask us a question. It's brought to you by O'Reilly Auto Parts. Simply tweet your question at CBS Sports Radio or at Zach Gelb using the hashtag AskThePros. Be listening later in the show. We might answer your question. Think O'Reilly Auto Parts for all your car care needs. Get guaranteed low prices and excellent customer service from the professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Unfortunate what happened last year with Cam Rising, where you win back-to-back Pac-12 championships, you have the injury, and then it's like, okay, you're going to be coming back, then you realize you're not going to be coming back, and now we get to see Cam Rising play one last season with the Utes as they do enter the Big 12, and with Whittingham going through a conference change before, and how many Pac-12 teams you do have moving into the Big 12 as well, I think that's a team that could have a seamless transition and you get your star quarterback and your star tight end back, that's going to be a team that's going to be really alive for this upcoming season of college football. And I guess you could say, if you want to give, I know it's a way too premature dark horse Heisman candidate, and I don't even know what the odds are, to be fair, but let's say Utah wins the Big 12 this year, and Cam Rising, he could be a dark horse candidate for the Heisman. Right, They were going to make a big push for him and thought they were going to when he returned. And then you had the whole injury. And then, okay, he missed all last year. But that's going to be the biggest thing for me. And I know Coach said he's 100%. But when you get back on the field, how much are you thinking still about the injury? And Cam Rising, he's just a warrior dude. He's like one of those classic college quarterbacks. I could see him having a monster redemption season this year, getting back into play. All right, he's at Gelb Show, CBS Sports Radio. We will go from college football to college basketball. When we return, one of my favorite analysts, longtime friend of the show, the coach, Seth Greenberg, going to stop by. Does a great job at ESPN. We'll get his reaction to Virginia's dud last night. Only 14 points in the first half. We'll get his final four picks. Is there going to be some redemption for Purdue? And also, is anyone going to be able to take down UConn? We'll have that conversation for you live. In five minutes with Seth Greenberg, still to come, Bruce Pearl, who's back in the NCAA tournament, SC champions with the Auburn Tigers. They go up against Yale on Friday. Bruce Pearl will join us in the final hour of the show as well. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining.
three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Live, he's nationwide on CBS Sports Radio. This is the Zach Gelb Show. All right, you're rocking and rolling. Hour number two of our radio program. It is the Zach Gelb Show, coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio. One of the preeminent voices covering college basketball these days is Coach Seth Greenberg of ESPN. And he's kind enough, as always, to join us right here this time of the year on this show. Coach, always great to see you. Thanks so much for doing this. And how you been? Any better, I couldn't stand myself. This is a great time of the year. You think about a championship week, obviously the bracket reveal, the start of the NCAA tournament, you got the Masters, you got the Derby. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. And you are such a big shot. Now, I, I'm, I'm just honored that I got invited to be on the Zach Gelb show. Well, I really do appreciate that. Um, let me start you off with Virginia, because you know this time of the year, there's always a team early that people are like, why did they get into the NCAA tournament? Usually that team finds a way to win a game or two, but Virginia last night only put up 14 points at half, and it was just really, really ugly to watch, right? I could sit there and make a case for Indiana State, you're right, a pit, uh, the three Big East schools. Why do you ultimately think the committee put Virginia into that spot last night? I think it was the Florida win early in the season. Uh, you know, you look at their resume, they didn't beat the Dukes in North Carolinas. I mean, so, I mean, the body worked. They were third-place team in the ACC. I was the third-place team twice in the ACC and didn't get in. So, 
I mean, it's not like that can't happen. Uh, their non-conference transfer schedule was pretty good. Uh, that was embarrassing. It was embarrassing for the ACC. When you play in the NCAA tournament, you not only play for your brand, your university, but you also play for your conference. And that was a really bad reflection on the ACC. And I was really surprised they got in. And the reason I was surprised they got in is, look, they had four games in the month of February. They didn't, they didn't get 50. So they're only getting 14 in the first half. It's not a huge shock. Now, honestly, did I think they were going to be one of those teams that unplugged, plugged back in, rebooted and actually won a couple of games because of style of play. Yes, but they were absolutely awful. And I think besides being awful, I didn't think they played with a sense of urgency or energy at any point in that game. And that's disappointing. And it's not the system, Zach, all right, because the system with good players wins. It's the players. They have not recruited well enough. They lost pros and replaced them with role players. Reese Speakman has not been surrounded by the same players he was surrounded by when he was a freshman and a sophomore. And uh, they've got to go out and they've got to get some dudes. They've got to improve their NIL. They might have to go through the transfer portal if they can get kids in Virginia. But that was embarrassing. It was hard to watch. But let me just ask you this, and you're more plugged in th than I am, and I'm just seeing it from afar. Because of what this new era is with the transfer portal and with NIL and how tough it is to develop players now, does the system then need to change just because of the landscape and the structure of the sport right now? You probably need to adjust it. You know, like agility is the key to any good business, uh, whether it's a coach, whether it's a CEO, whether it's anyone who does anything. I mean, in your business as well. I mean, you've got to have agility. You've got to stay ahead of the curve. That's where John Cal Perry's been so great. He's always stayed ahead of the curve. You know, Tony is kind of entrenched in what he does, but he said something in his post-game press conference. He said he's going to have to look at it. Now, they're never going to be a one-and-done destination. They're never going to be living the portal. But you can fill voids in the portal. Like they brought the minor kid in, Jordan Minor. He's, he just wasn't good enough. If you're going to go to the portal, you got to go to the portal for someone who can have an impact. Uh, and you've got to balance your roster because you're losing players. Kadeem Shedrick, all right, he's at Texas. He could have helped them win games this year. Uh, and you've got to make it more attractive. Uh, and the university's got to help as well with the collectives. Uh the cost of doing business, your investment has to equal your expectation in college basketball. It's sad in a way, and I, I'm all for players getting paid. That's not a problem. It's sad that there's so much static around these players, whether it's a workout guy, a grassroots coach, or a high school coach, a parent. Uh, there are so many voices. And then, you know, they got they got to worry about their social media. They got to worry about the collective. They got to worry about their NIL. Where does winning fit in? Where does just getting lost in the game? And then where does education fit in as well? So there's a lot of stuff going on. It's got to be cleaned up. Yet we're going to have a great NCAA tournament. We've had a great year. Conference tournaments, you saw all those ones go down. All season long, we've seen ranked teams beat, get beat by unranked teams. That's going to be a microcosm of the NCAA tournament. Seth Greenberg here with us. Not just in their side of the bracket, their region, but in the whole field. Who has the best shot team or two, give me two teams to take down UConn. Like, who do you put the most confidence in? If UConn doesn't win at all, then who's the next two teams? Well, I'd start in that bracket. I'd say it's Iowa State style of play. You know, style makes fights. So you think about Iowa State, they they can maybe disrupt the flow and rhythm of that Connecticut offense. They do a good job once the ball gets below the foul line of keeping it on the sideline and forcing it down. Uh, they're relentless. They almost play violently. I mean, like there are you watch an Iowa State game and they're you know you say aggressive, though no, they're much more than aggressive. They defensively they are violent. Now, how the game officiate going to be officiated is going to be interesting. They have the ability to get on, up and underneath Tristan Newton. They've got the ability to maybe keep it on one side and then eyeball over. So they got the ability to disrupt uh, UConn offense that plays just differently than everyone else. I mean, they really do. It's ball and people movement. I always say Danny Hurley, defensively, they play like they're from Jersey City. Offensively, they play like they're from FIBA. I mean, it's just, you know, it's just kind of the way they play. So uh, I would say Iowa State, and then I would say on the other side of the bracket, you know, Auburn's similar, but not as relentless. On the other side of the bracket, just on pure talent, it could be Kentucky. Yeah. I don't know if those young guards have the discipline to defend them, but on pure talent, that backcourt is ridiculous. Do you think it all comes together for Kentucky in the tournament? I, I have them going to the championship game because I, I like Cal. So, and, and I've seen Shepard yeah. play. He's phenomenal. But do you think they could put it all together and, and go on this run in their region and get to the final four? I think they can. It's if they will. Uh, they got to guard the ball. 
Uh, they've got to have one way to guard a ball screen. They got to keep the ball out of the lane. They got to rebound the ball defensively. I have them playing Connecticut in the championship game. Uh, I just look at the backward. Antonio Reeves, monster season. Actually, every time he shoots it, you think it's going in. And it's been good in clutch time, which obviously last year he really struggled in, in that game that they lost in the NCAA tournament. Reed Shepard just makes the game easy for everyone else. Uh, you know, you talk about Dillingham, you know, he's like an M1 mixtape. He can get a shot anytime he wants. Justin Edwards, yeah, I think that's a big key. Like Justin Edwards is starting to emerge a little bit, which gives him a big wing defender. And he's merging on the defensive end, which has made the, the game easier for him offensively. They got 21 feet of post player. And the keys to this team are Adufiero, Trey Mitchell, and, and, and Antonio Reeves. Because those older guys have got to be the heartbeat of this team. And then let the younger guys just go out and hoop. Just go out and play. Be aggressive. But there's got to be an energy. And the one thing Cal's done with this team, and I'm sure you've seen some of the videos and I've talked to him a whole bunch, he's taken putting all the pressure on himself. He just wants those guys to go out and play. Good enough to win at Auburn, good enough to win at Alabama. They're good enough to make a deep run in the NCAA tournament. That's That that was my mindset. And they did a good job of defending Alabama's guards. They did a good job of defending uh, Auburn's guards. So they've done it. But then, you know, they have games like they had against a and They have games like they had against Gonzaga, where they literally got beat on the same set five times in a row. And it wasn't even a hard set to defend. But I think they've grown up a little bit since then. Talking to Seth Greenberg. So injury-wise, it looks like Cole going to play for Marquette. We know McCuller Jr. is now out for Kansas. I guess Dickinson is going to come back. Uh, Confidence-wise, was some of the unknown with Marquette and Kansas going into this tourney? I'm confident with Kolick. Uh, speaking to Danny Hurley the other day, he said he saw him at the Big East tournament and, and that he was going to play. Now, he's going to play. He hasn't played in a while, though. What's his conditioning going to be like? What's his field going to be like? I mean, like, he is a connector. He makes the game easy for everyone. I mean, he's ridiculous. He's tough enough to get in lane and score, but he's crafty enough to get everyone a shot and possession. It takes a lot of pressure off of Oso Godaro. Takes a lot of pressure off of Jones. And Jones has been Cam Jones has been terrific with him when he's out. Over 20 points a game, I think over five assists a game. So in a way, you're getting a, a more versatile Cam Jones alongside his color. Now, the Kansas thing, I think it's a mess. Uh, I think it's a mess. I think that they're losing the best defender, the best perimeter scorer, their best shot maker. And the other thing that changes, and Zach, you probably noticed a little bit, everyone moves up on the scouting report. You see, the game was a lot easier when McCullough's on one side for Johnny Furphy. The game was a lot easier when Dewan Harris could rely on, on McCullough. Without him, the pressure on those two guys is so great. And then spacing. How you, you, know, you want to get Hunter Dickinson the ball? If he gets frustrated, you know, what does he do? He goes, and get, goes away from the basket. Instead of just getting down a block where he could dominate the game. They're playing against a Sanford team that Shoots about 45% of the shots from the three-point line. They turn you over about 21% of their possessions. They play at one of the fastest speeds. They score in transition. Altitude could be a factor. They play 10 guys. Uh, Achora Achora is, is, is legit. So, I mean, it's going to be uh, it's going to be interesting. The biggest question mark I have is the Midwest because Tennessee, I, like, I love Dalton Connect. Purdue, right, we know what happened to them last year. Uh, Kansas, you just laid it out perfectly. I picked Creighton because I just don't think a lot of people will pick them, but I can't tell you I have a ton of confidence with them, but I like McDermott, and they have some guys that returned from last year's team. Gonzaga, some people saying they could get upset in the first round. Other people have them going to the Elite Eight. Like, who's the team in that Midwest region that you latch on and will say, okay, that's the team I'll put in the Final Four? I'm, I'm I'm all in as long as Braden Smith is healthy and playing 100. percent And he wasn't healthy in that semifinal game against Wisconsin. The way Chucky Hepburn went right around him, and that guy's a tough, hard-nosed, physical defender. I mean, he gave no resistance. You knew something was. If he's healthy, I'm all into Purdue, not Perdot. A lot of people call him Perdot. I, I I named that bracket the Just Do It bracket, like like Purdue and Tennessee. Like, let's go, man. Let's get to the Elite Eight. Let's compete to get to the Final Four. Like, but why are you it. all in on Purdue? Because everyone's going to say, I don't know, people are going to tell me when Virginia lost to UMBC the next year they got the job done. Why that. could they get the job done? They're a better team. Those freshmen or sophomores, Lance Jones helps them. Mason Gillis gives them some versatility in their front court. Zach Eadie is impossible in a short turnaround to prepare for. Uh, you know, look, look, 
look, I understand the St. Pete, and I understand losing to Harvard on a hackensack, and I understand that. This team also, if you look at who they played in the non-conference, they played all these great teams, all these different styles, and they kicked the crap out of them. So they got to handle the pressure of the opening round and maybe the opening two games. Uh, I have enough confidence in them that as long as they're healthy. Now, Braden Smith's not healthy. If he plays like he did against Wisconsin, they might not get they might not get to the Sweet 16. But if he's healthy, he changed. Braden Smith's an All-American. Like, you know, we, we, we look, oh, they're backward, they're backward, they're backward. You know, or, well, when they lose, they turn it over 16 times a game. Well, most teams, when they lose, they turn it over. But they don't lose very often. You know, I mean, like, if you look at it, like, Tennessee loses when they don't shoot the three and their opponent shoots the three. You know, uh, Arizona loses when they don't guard the three and, and, and they take bad shots. There's always a time, you know, when you lose that part of it, what makes you your team, but they're a 40% three-point shooting team, Purdue. They only turn it over 16% of their possessions. Uh, they can play inside, outside. They're a terrific passing team. Uh, their analytics are, are great. I'm not a big analytics guy. I think them in Tennessee will advance. My sleeper in that in that field is is, is in that bracket is is Oregon. Dana Altman has never lost a first round game. That would put him against Creighton probably. And Folly Dante, uh, in the last run in the in the uh, Pac-12 tournament, the final Pac-12 tournament, 2011, two blocks a game. When he's good, then Shellstad's better. When he's good, Kuzenar's better. Uh, Dana Altman's style of play, second day. Obviously, it would be the old conspiracy theory playing against his team. I like Creighton, but they, if it was four and four, I'd be all in on Creighton. But five through eight, I have no confidence in any of those guys. And it puts a lot of pressure on Ashworth. You know, like because Ashworth's starting to play well. He's played really well. But look, I have great, I have great, great com- conference, uh, confidence in Alexander and Shireman and, and Cockbrenner. The other thing is they always play that that drop coverage. If they get against a really good guard, uh, I'm not sure that that's when they've struggled a little bit. I just think that when you go to the bench, you're not getting anything out of Miller. They're not getting anything out of any of the guys. Green played really well in the game that they ran Connecticut, but there's a there's a butt to it. I mean, that was Connecticut, short turnaround, big game. You know, there was a lot to that game. Talking to Seth Greenberg a few more minutes with the former basketball coach now doing a great job for a bunch of years for ESPN. Uh, I think I'm like everybody else in the West. I want to see UNC in Arizona with just the natural Caleb Love connection. Is that what you have in the Elite Eight or do you go somewhere else uh, upsetting us of seeing that one-two matchup? No, uh, that's my till we meet again bracket, by the way. <laughs> uh, and, Are you uh, going to sing? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, no. But uh, I, look, look, everyone wants to see RJ and Caleb. That's great. But I think that game might come down to uh, Harrison Ingram and Keisha Johnson. Keisha Johnson, monster year. I mean, think about what San Diego State, what they've done without Keisha Johnson, losing those guys. But Keisha Johnson brings some toughness to that, that Arizona team that they need. They've got to be more consistent in their perimeter play, take good shots, uh, defend a little more purposely in their losses. They haven't defended as well, but. I do have that matchup, and that'll be fascinating. I mean, let's face it. It'll be an absolute fascinating. And seeing those guys to go at it, see how they interact before the game, the handshakes, everything about it is is good drama. Uh, so Carolina's good. Uh, Cormac Ryan's got to make some shots. I mean, I think it's the biggest problem for them. I mean, like, they beat Duke, and he's, he's on uh, Franklin Street partying, then he struggles. They beat Duke again. He's on the top of the bus. Then he struggles. I mean, nothing personally, but Cormac, get in the gym and work on your jumper. All right. You can celebrate after the season. Uh, you know, priorities are the most important thing. He's a very really good player and he brings him toughness. But he's it, like, he's the threat of making shots. But if he makes one or two, if he runs the floor and gets out in transition, what is that? What happens? Now, when he runs the floor, you got to match up with him. So now when Almondo runs the floor, it's advanced pass, post pass, layup. You do that one or two times. Now, Armando's energized. Now, all of a sudden, you're stretching the court on the first side. Now, you're stretching the court on the first side. That means the weak side guys are going to get the help. So, now it's a quick skip. You're forcing closeouts, and guys are driving it and making plays. So, uh, I think Ryan's a, a big part of that. But, yeah, I, I have Carolina Carolina winning that. And, you know, the black and blue bracket up top is just crazy. You know, you, you know when you, you're talking about, you know, Auburn, Iowa State, 
you know, San Diego State, FAU. I mean, it's just it's it's an insane bracket. Drake, who's really good. I yeah, mean, Tucker UConn's is the number really one good. overall seed. It doesn't feel like the committee thought they were the number one overall seed though with the draw. I guess they gave them a region and then loaded up their region. Now look, it, they're going to take over Brooklyn, and I think you go from Brooklyn to Boston, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, those are two home games. They One remind thing about me, the Huskies, they, they travel. You know who they remind me of? I'm not saying necessarily style of play, but Villanova, that second time that they won the championship under Jay, they had a tough draw, right? Everyone was loving Buddy Heald in, in, in that matchup, and they just smacked everybody they play. Like that, I think UConn could obviously do that this year. They don't play a lot of close games. Here's the deal, I, I, and you know I'm I'm pretty close to Danny. This this is actually a good bracket for him because the guy needs a cause. He needs something to get his attention and to get his team's attention. And now he's got a cause. You know we, they've given us no respect, but he sees big picture. But the way he is, he 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 focuses on what's in front of him. I can speak to him Sunday night. He said the only thing I'm worried about is Stetson. I mean that's the way he gets laser focused, or as he calls locked in. And they'll worry about what's next, next. And they're, they're really, really good at it. And I've sat in other film sessions. Uh, his film sessions are so real. Uh, he's he, as good. A, I used to say his dad's practices were the best practices I've ever seen. And let me tell you something. There's no difference. Every single day, the accountability in those practices, the intensity of those practices from the coaches to the players, uh, to anyone who walks in the gym, it is second to none. It's really, it's really fun to watch. That's one of the reasons I go down there because it's just so much fun to watch. He's the face of the sport right now, Danny Hurley. Hundred percent, hundred percent. But how about player-wise in this tournament, pound for pound? Who do you think is the best player in this tournament? Because the women's game, right? You got Caitlin Clark, you got Angel Reese, you got Paige Buckets. Like, there's a lot of faces that are the actual players in the men's game. I'm trying to figure out who is the face of this tournament from a player standpoint. Well, it's got to be Zach Eady, two-time player of the year. I mean, that, that, along with that, goes with pressure. But, you know, big guys don't sell. You know, people can't get excited about big guys. So, I mean, is it going to be Rob Dillingham going off and doing crazy things and, like, you know, one night? Is it going to be, you know, you can go down down the list. Is Jamal Shedd coming up with a steal late in the game? You know, is it going to be uh, a matchup that became, becomes the story? Uh, is it the Cinderella, New Mexico, who get, maybe – you know, gets by Clemson, then gets by Baylor. And all of a sudden we, we do have a Patino in the elite, you know, the sweet 16 and the lead eight. I mean, there's a lot of things that can happen. I'll tell you the other thing just for, on a big picture. Yesterday I watched, I was in the studio for the NIT games. How hard those teams played last night was terrific. And like for the people that decided not to go, I have no problem with the guys opting out of the NIT. If your team's not going to be committed, if you know half your guys can be with their workout guy trying to get ready for the draft, the other half's already in the portal because they they didn't get to the NCAA tournament, so they want to transfer. We saw what happened in bowl games; it was brutal. They were mm-hmm. exhibitions; they weren't games. Last night we saw games. We saw guys that were there. We saw Jake Diebler get his first win as a head coach at, at Ohio State. I mean, like when he was. And I'll tell you one thing: if he lost that game, he could have opted out of that thing, and not had the pressure of. Doing that, because let's face it, if he lost that game, it was all, did we do the right thing? Did we hire him? They lost to Cornell. Uh, but instead, he coached a brilliant game, managed the game well, got his team back going. They win the game. That, that like, to me, that was the first game pressure that he had. And he handled it well. And we saw a great rivalry in Providence and Boston College, which they should play twice every year. We need to get rivalries back in our game. Uh, so, you know, and we saw Virginia – at Tech and 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 Richmond, we saw USF in Central Florida. We saw that where there was a, almost a fight on the court. So the teams that did opt in, you know, that was good hard play in basketball. I look, I had no problem with people opting out. Like people say, "Oh my God, you you, you got access to you. like Tom and I love Tom Creed. You got access to your players twenty four seven these days. You know, everyone wants to coach their team, but it's not your decision; it's your player's decision. Because if you don't have a team, or your team, or team that's representative. Who wants to coach two walk-ons and, and and three guys that were at the end of the bench to get you know your rear end kicked? So, like in theory, it sounds great, but I think once these teams committed, let me tell you, they committed and they played really, really hard. You know, North Texas defending their championship from a year ago. You saw really good games, and uh, 
it was fun to watch. It was fun to watch, and those teams are there for the right reasons. So I still think the NIT should be a mid-major national championship. That's what I think it should be. Wow. The teams that don't, that don't don't get to the tournament make the NIT and, and, and blow it up and make it big. You're saying only mid-majors get in or just – Yep. Okay. Yep. I think when we break off of these four conferences, I think you take the bottom 16 teams or 18, you know, 18 leagues – and, you know, obviously there are certain teams that, that will not be in that group that I don't consider mid-majors. I don't consider Gonzaga mid-major. I don't consider St. Mary's a mid-major. I don't sit, consider much of the uh, A-10 a, a mid-major, no, the bottom of the Big Ten, uh, I mean, Atlantic 10 a mid-major. So I just think we're going to have four pods. You know, we talk about the first four. There are going to be four first fours, all right? And, and it's going to be all the mid-majors. It's going to be basically – all those mid-major teams and they're going to play their way into the first round. And that's the way, because look, when you have, Zach, you're going to have conferences with 20 and 25 teams soon. All right. 20 and 25 teams and people can say, Oh, well, you know what? That team was, you know, 12 and 12 in their conference. Yeah. Cause there are no rocking chair games in that conference. You got to play well every single night. You're only going to play six other games and probably one MTE and a couple of made for TV games. So I think you got to find something that all of, the others, whether it's the Northeast Conference, whether it's the MAC, whether it's the MAAC, whether it's you, you know, you there that where they can actually compete for a national championship, and no different than what is the FBS and this uh, this college football, right? It's no difference than that. You don't think those people and that would, FBS is that the, the lower division, right? A A FCS, yeah, yeah, FCS, yeah. Mm -hmm. You don't think those people celebrate that championship? They know they're not Alabama. They know they're not those other those other programs. But you know what? They can get a chance to play on and celebrate a championship. It's great, you know, and, and build it up where it's something special. Now we have the NIT. We got the CBI. The CBI they got they got to they got to buy me. You look at the, the field in that thing. It's like you know half of the half of the league half of the tournament is got a losing record. Yeah. So. Seth, always appreciate it. Thanks so much. Now March Madness can get underway once you join us on this show. So we appreciate the time. You're Thank the man. You. Proud of you, brother. Proud of you. You got it. There he is, the great Seth Greenberg, joining us on the Zach Gelb Show. A lot to unpack from that conversation. We'll come on back and do so. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remain. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining.
two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. The Zach Gelb Show is on the air across the nation on CBS Sports Radio. Here's Zach Gelb. All right, it is Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. This was a little bit surprising earlier today. Tiger Woods is going to give it a go for the Masters as that was announced. I was not really anticipating that. That was not really on my radar, but even with the physical state or lack of it of Tiger Woods, just having him there for the Masters, if he could get through the entire tournament and if he makes the cut, even if he doesn't, and I know it's the Masters and you know I'm going to be watching anyway, and I'm going to be having my Masters pool that I'll jump into as well, but just having him there bare minimum for what you hope is the first two days of the tournament, and then we'll see if he makes the cut. Uh, that's tremendous for the sport, and even – with Tiger Woods uh, not being right, the old Tiger and us giving him giving us that moment years ago at the Masters when I thought he was never going to win another major again. There is always a presence, there is always a roar that is felt with Tiger, and he always does give uh, a ratings boost and a ratings increase. And there have been other players that have been able to stand out in golf. I really think the popularity of golf did grow. During the pandemic, and there were individual stars that did get me excited to tune in. But now with Liv, and then you have this very ambiguous um, financial merger and things like that. And there's still a uh, future is unknown. The individuality with golf, when you have some guys playing at Liv and then some guys playing at the PGA Tour, then that did take a hit. And it was very short lived like crazy popularity during the pandemic where everyone was in on golf, but having, for the most part, everyone under the roof uh, at Augusta or everyone in the, the building at Augusta and Tiger now 
going to give it a go. I think it's a positive thing. And it makes you think, you know, you go through the major sports. Like, Tiger always gives golf a boost. And the name of Tiger is still preeminent, even if it's not reflected with the play on the course through 18 holes a day. And we'll see if he can get through an entire tournament. But you go through Major League Baseball, the face of the sport right now, the biggest draw to the sport is Shohei Otani, but he never gets into the postseason. Barring a disaster, he'll get into the postseason this year because he's off the Angels, and now he's with the Dodgers. And how about this? Can I ask you um, for an honest answer, Samter? And, and I'll ask Botcher as well. Did you guys know the baseball season started today? Like, up until I either just said it or until you had um, – Maybe see seeing a highlight of it. Did you know that the Dodgers are playing the Padres at like 3 a.m. Eastern time or whatever it was this morning? And the baseball season for the Dodgers and Padres did start today. Did you know that? Yes. When did you know that? Uh, over the weekend, I had read some things about, um, you know, Otani obviously being in Korea. And then there was some banner that was put up to, you know, in Korea to preview and to promote the game of a player that was no longer on the Padres. And so there was a lot of backlash against MLB for that. So I knew that it was happening. And then obviously I you know, just kind of followed it along. But yes, they didn't do a great job Terrible of like job promoting, promoting it. I only knew about Honestly, I knew more about it because of the, of the mistake on the banner of a guy who was no longer there. Uh, but outside of the game actually being played, you know, ESPN kind of discussed it a mm-hmm. little bit. But it's Shohei Otani. Yeah. And I know it's like, you know, it was an early morning kind of game. but on the, on the West Coast, it started at 3 a.m. local time there. M- mention something about it. Do something. But, yeah, I mean, there, there's been well, some talk baseball. about baseball, it. Just not enough. Baseball has a terrible marketing plan. And yeah. a lot of that goes back to their incompetent pose of a commissioner and, and Rob Manfred, who I am not a fan of. But, like, it's 162 games, so I'm not going to be up in arms. But even someone that's in the sports world, I would have legitimately not have known that the baseball season started today if it wasn't last week. We had to move up our fantasy baseball draft because people were losing their minds when you have keepers with the Dodgers or the Padres that if you waited an extra week to do the fantasy baseball draft, then obviously the players and the numbers like today, like the 3.25 points that I got from Xander Bogarts would not have counted because they would not have been on my roster then. I know Xander Bogarts is not one of my keepers. I got him in the draft. So that's the only reason why I knew that the baseball season for the Dodgers and Padres did start is because of the fact that I had to move up my fantasy baseball draft and do it on uh, Sunday. So, Otani's the biggest draw in baseball. Tiger's still the biggest draw in golf whenever he's a part of a tournament. For hockey, I think it's Connor McDavid. He's the best player in the sport. Um, For football, I think most people would say Patrick Mahomes. But, Samson, let me run something by you. This past year, Isn't it Travis Kelsey? I know Mahomes won another Super Bowl. I know Mahomes won another Super Bowl MVP. And football doesn't need any more eyeballs. But how many more eyeballs did they get this year? Because Travis Kelsey, who's one of the greatest tight ends of all time, was dating Taylor Swift, and that brought a new audience in. Like, Mahomes, we all know, is the face of the sport, but was the biggest draw this year, Travis Kelsey with the Kansas City Chiefs. I think Kelsey was the biggest draw for the non-football fan and maybe a little bit for the average football fan. But I, I, it feels like a flash in the pan. It feels like it was kind of like, you know, catching lightning in the bottle for this year. I don't know if he's going to be the biggest draw. He is a big name. He's entertaining. He has his podcast. He says interesting things. But I have a hard time. Like, as much as you want to like or dislike the Jets or Aaron Rodgers, like Aaron Rodgers is a big... I mean, he didn't play pe- last year. Yeah, but I'm just saying, like, that's the name that, like, people was like, oh, I, I want to see Aaron Rodgers. Oh, yeah. I, I was very excited to see how I was going to go with the Jets. But then he got hurt. So that went right out the window. Right. So I think, I think I Caleb Williams is going to be... I think it's probably Mahomes. I think Caleb Williams is going to be a big draw this year. Dak is always a huge draw. Mm. He's whether, whether you think he's great or not, he's a huge draw. He's Every polarizing. Get, like, yes. like, him individually is not polarizing, but Dak is a player becomes polarizing because you have the delusional cowboy fan that thinks they're actually going to do something great. And then everyone else is just being realistic saying Dak's a good quarterback, but come postseason time, him and his team never shows up. Right. But just the reality of ratings, Cowboys blow every other game out of the water, mostly because they're that 425 star, but the Cowboys games always get highest ratings sure. every week. And Dak is a part of that. The Cowboy brand is the other part of that. So I think Dak is a big draw, but, 
The one thing about football that you'll say is that because it's such a team-oriented sport, it's hard to say, like, I'm watching this game for a guy, right? You're watching the game for the game. More so than most any other sport. Basketball, you're watching for a guy. Well, it's Baseball, also the best regular season product. Like, I don't need incentive to tune into a football game. Right, and, and I, I will need incentive, right. and there's so many baseball, and there's so fewer football games, but 162 games. Like, I love baseball. To watch every game, it, it it's a lot. Now, you tell me Otani's coming to New York. Uh, what is he, in, the in like, the first week of June? Uh, I have people saying, oh, let's go to a Yankee and a Dodger game to see Otani. Uh, for football, I don't need a singular person to draw me in, but there are players that you love to watch that are extremely entertaining. Basketball, I still think Steph Curry is the biggest draw in the sport. Now, LeBron, historically, right, is is the better player. And we know, like, LeBron is, I don't want this to turn into a debate, is the second greatest player of all time. But for Steph, it's he does such a unique thing on the court where his shooting is just ridiculous. And I'm not saying we could all relate to Steph, but if you go into a gym and you say who's easier to replicate, like a, a youth league gym, is it LeBron or is it Steph Curry? It's Steph because you could just stand 10 feet from behind the three-point arc and just try to attempt. He actually sinks them, but try to a- attempt three-pointer after three-pointer. He's also just a smaller human being compared to LeBron James. So right now, those are, those are the guys that I think are the biggest draws in sports. And then in women's basketball, it's clearly Caitlin Clark. So women's basketball, it's Caitlin Clark. Golf, it's Tiger Woods. Hockey, it's Connor McDavid. Baseball, it's Shohei Otani. Basketball, it's Steph Curry. And the NFL, for me, it's Patrick Mahomes. Who's the biggest draw in sports right now? 855 212 cbs 855 212 I'll make this very quick. We also heard Conor McGregor saying that he might be coming I back this him. summer. You're a big UFC fan. I yeah. used to be. Is Conor McGregor still the biggest draw in UFC? Not the best fighter the biggest draw in the UFC when he returns this summer. It pains me to say it, but you're, you are right on that. Like you said, I was right earlier in the week. Now I will admit when you are right, when he returns, I hope he gets his ass kicked. And I don't even know if he will ever return. And I don't even know if he'll fight Chandler. And I said this to Dana White's face two years ago at the Super Bowl that I think Michael Chandler will kick his ass, but I can't stand Conor McGregor with how much crap he's done out of the octagon you know, beating up a, an old guy because he w- you wouldn't try your your overrated whiskey and things like that and, and everything else that comes with Conor McGregor, he is uh, past the prime, let's just say. Way past the prime, over the hill in Conor McGregor. But if he announces that he's going to fight at Madison Square Garden, let's say in November, yeah, I, I probably would go and, <laughs> and want to see it. But I'd be rooting for him to get his ass kicked. Like, that's the difference. To be a draw, I think the guys that are the great draws are guys that – 50% of the people love him, and then 50% of the people hate him. News brief next. Update time first. Here he is, the Ackman, Rich Ackerman. CBS Sports, Radio. Sports Flash. Well, two teams moved on in the NCAA tournament last night. Two more to advance tonight. The doubleheader tips off with another 16 versus 16 matchup when Grambling State beats Montana State. And Montana State coming off its Big Sky Championship against the South, uh, the SWAC champion. After 20 victories this year, Tigers head coach Dante Jackson said their hard work has paid off. That's something we live by. I always try to tell them that uh, I can't tell them if uh, you're going to make shots day to day. But I can tell you how hard you can play, and I can tell you that we can defend at a high level and rebound at a high level. Where that's kind of our identity. The Bobcats went 17-17 and 17 this year. Game 2 tonight features Colorado and Boise State, which is 0-9 in its tournament history, while the Buffaloes are coming off a 24-win season. The Celtics go for their seventh straight against the Bucks in Boston, while the Thunder, tied for the Western Conference lead with idol Denver, will host the Jazz. The baseball season opened in South Korea earlier today. Shohei Otani made quite an immediate impact for the Dodgers. The $700 million man had two hits and an RBI, as well as a stolen base in their 5-2 win over the Padres. I'm Rich Jack. Jim Rome here, coming up Thursday in the Jungle, a conversation with Vikings linebacker Blake Cashman and What's Your Beef? See you Thursday at 12 noon Eastern and 9 Pacific. You're in a five-minute break.
Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. For your daily news brief, we get you caught up on the rumors, reports, and reconnaissance from the day in sports. All right.
Alrighty, news break time. Zach Yelp Show, CBS Sports Radio. Let's start things off with Virginia's coach, Tony Bennett. His team embarrassing last night. Only 14 points at halftime. And obviously, they lost to Colorado State. They didn't belong in the NCAA tournament. Now the question becomes, will Tony Bennett reevaluate their system? Absolutely. I, I always have to examine, you know, our ability to to advance. Um, we've raised the bar really high here. We've qualified for this tournament, which, which is not an easy thing. Um, we've done well, but it's stung to get to this point and not advance. And so, of course, we've got to keep adding quality players. We've got to look at things certainly from a system standpoint. Absolutely. I just uh, I, I wish we could could have played better. When you have won a championship before at that school, playing a little bit of the participation trophy line doesn't fly with me. When he goes, yeah, we made the tournament, right? That's great. Like almost kind of set it up. Oh, I know we did still have a positive season. You didn't belong in the NCAA tournament. You shouldn't have been an NCAA tournament team. And I'm not going to trash his system because the system did win a championship, but with how much they rely on slowing the game down, defense and team chemistry, it's tough to build those things now in a landscape that just keeps on changing and changing and changing because of the transfer portal and NIL. Let's go to Conor McGregor. Samter brought this up earlier. He was on ESPN and he was asked when he will be returning to the UFC. Yeah, we got we got confirmation a few days ago that it's all systems go and the Mac, the Notorious will be returning in the UFC octagon this summer. This summer, that's fair. Hey, summer, Chandler, Michael Chandler? Yes, Michael Chandler, yeah. Mm-hmm. 185. It's Chandler, you have to f- shut up, Michael, you f- imbecile. The blade doesn't shut up. I like Mike, I'm gonna bust him up. I'm gonna bust Mike up, yeah? Ay, ay, ay. Now, it was a little tough to understand him for a second. Why did he get so frustrated there? Like you heard, was he, was there like a handler in the background? I know he's talking about Mike Chandler. And then I said, oh, maybe he's upset that Mike Chandler's been talking. Michael Chandler's going to kick his ass. He's actually in shape. Conor McGregor isn't in shape. Yeah, but I don't think that even matters. I think Conor McGregor became popular because he's the best bleep talker in the history of sport, maybe. I mean, you, know, you got Larry Bird, you got Kevin Garnett, you got Conor McGregor. Conor McGregor was entertaining and a bleep talker. Muhammad Ali right Here's up the there problem, in that same though. class of just being able to talk bleep and back it up until he until he couldn't. Now he can't back it up anymore. So that's why it's all empty threats. Sure, it's like but, empty stats. Sure, but th- I, I'm going to watch him fight. Sure. It's going to be the first UFC fight that I'm going to see in, in three years because well, I want to see him go. That's a bad Come on. The problem is Pereira, I, I, just great lost, I lost faith in the, faith in the UFC. That, that's fine. I love the UFC. I used to not watch as much years ago. Now, whenever there's a big card, I will tune in. Like, I'm not going to tell you. I could tell you this guy wins. Where does he advance and who does he go on to face? But I'm really into it. I I love uh, watching the UFC, and I've gone uh, two times. The problem with Conor McGregor, he just infuriates me. I get it. He's still a draw. Like, I I just told you last segment. I will watch when he fights, but there's no way. I think there's a 0% chance that Conor McGregor is fighting this summer. This fight's supposed to be happening for two years. I talked to Dana White two years ago at a Super Bowl about this fight. It's still two years later. This guy doesn't have his act together. He's out of shape. He's probably on some uh, some steroids, if we're going to just say a little bit, for a while. And, you know, he's eating and drinking too much. He's partying. He cares more about being the celebrity than the fighter. He does not prioritize being a fighter anymore. And when you win all that those fights and you make all this money and you take the beating or you've issued the beating that you've given out, it still comes at a cost. You don't need to fight anymore. But to try to half-ass it now to see you get pummeled again, yeah, I, I will uh, tune in for that. But I don't think it's happening this summer because we keep on getting told it's happening, it's happening, it's happening, and then it never does happen. Here is uh, Mike Williams on why he elected to sign with Samter still, J-E-T-S, Jets, 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 because you have not got the tattoo yet, so I will not call you a Kansas City Chiefs fan. Well, for me personally, I just felt like it was a great fit for me playing alongside Garrett. Kind of remind me of uh, Keenan a little bit, uh, similar style play, great route runners. And I feel like we can uh, complement each other in that area. Uh, the running game is pretty good. Defense is elite. So I just feel like we got a, a pretty good opportunity ahead of us. Uh, just looking forward to it. Ryan Botcher, my understanding is you are a Jet fan. I think you are an intelligent human being. There's a lot of, I know you're not new anymore, but newer people that have come in 
that I don't really trust, that I don't have a lot of confidence in. I think you kind of get the reputation of being like that number one prospect that comes in and then you've delivered. So this question is going to really determine where a relationship goes from here. And the answer, you are a Jet fan with the moves they made this offseason getting Teron Smith, now getting Mike Williams. Where's your confidence with this team heading into the season? I have no confidence until I actually see it. Thank you. You are a sane human being. You are a smart fan, unlike Samter yesterday, who's still a Jet fan, and he's like, Kansas City Chiefs, even though they're my Chiefs, watch out, the Jets, their roster, it's loaded, it's spectacular, it's unbelievable. First of all, that was tongue-in-cheek, because my Chiefs oh, are going to blow... Oh, are you, Tiki Barber, Mr. Tongue-in-Cheek no, now? I, the, the Jets, watch out, Chiefs, he come on. He was actually tongue-in-cheek, that, you weren't yesterday. That's ridiculous, the Chiefs are going to blow the You've Jets out of the water. You've had an identity crisis where you are saying you love the Chiefs, but down deep, you're still a Jets fan. No, so here's the thing. The, the Chiefs have nothing to worry about with the Jets, at least not yet, until we see what the Jets can be. My point was on paper. Now, I went back and I started looking at some of the PFF grades. The 49ers are elite. This is what you lose elite. with PFF grades. Yeah, so the 49ers from every metric. Every Do this point in metric, 30 seconds because there's another audio clip I want to get. Every metric, the 49ers are the best. So the Jets don't contend there. But I was looking at all the other teams with great rosters, and the Jets can cont- contend with their roster on paper with any other team other than the 49ers. Here's the problem with the Jets roster. Teron Smith is an injury waiting to happen at this stage of his career. I said it's healthy and on paper. Mike Williams is an injury waiting to happen. So the Jets are two players getting hurt, and it's not like they never get hurt. And Aaron Rodgers coming off an Achilles. I get all that. that. I give him a pass. But I, I understand. I heard what you said. I have ears that are working. I will respond to what you said. The Jets are an injury away from a left tackle and a wide receiver being the same team as they were a year ago, outside of you get Rodgers back, so you'd be a few games improvement. This is not a Super Bowl team. This is not a team that's going to win multiple playoff games. Uh, finally, here's Saquon Barkley. Funny story about his daughter and the Eagles, courtesy of the Eagles Twitter. But my daughter, funny story with her, she knows there's a lot of history in my career with the Eagles. I remember one time when I was with the Giants and we lost to Philly in the playoffs. We went to diner to get some breakfast, and there was a bird. And she was like, Daddy, oh no, oh no. And I'm like, what is it? She points to the bird, and she was like, it's the Eagles. It's the Eagles. Um, and me and Anna, you know, we just started laughing. I just put my head down. I just kind of start shaking. So when I told her that we're going to be going to Philly, uh, she kind of was just like, does that mean we're going to win now? And I just started smiling again. And I was like, hopefully, hopefully we, we, we can win some more games. Wow. Great audio quality by the Eagles, by the way. But, um, you know, your children know everything. And they kind of kept him honest. He's saying, okay, now he could be a winner going on from the Giants. I can hear Mraz already down the hall. Oh, I'm just waiting for him to fumble. I'm waiting for him to drop the football once again. You're going to win nothing in Philadelphia. You're in a five-minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining.
three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds. Live, he's nationwide on CBS Sports Radio. This is the Zach Gelb Show. Here's your host, Zach Gelb. Number three of our radio program, how we doing? It is the Zach Gelb Show, coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio. Coming up 20 minutes from now, Auburn Tigers head coach, SEC champion, Bruce Pearl, going to join us right here on the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. Coming up on Friday, you do have Auburn going up against Yale. I don't know about you, Samter. Is it a pet peeve of yours? I have two pet peeve questions this time of the year for you. Whenever there is an Ivy League school and you get the cheesy broadcaster, I almost did it there, but then I realized I wasn't a cheesy broadcaster. They'll be like, oh, you have the Auburn Tigers going up, those smart kids from Yale. Does that annoy you whenever it's an Ivy League school like last year uh, when it was Princeton and they made their run to the Sweet 16 it was like, oh, it's the nerds and it's the jocks. Like, whenever you have an Ivy League school, we always say, oh, they're smart or, oh, they're a bunch of nerds. When you look at the players on the basketball court, even though they're very intelligent, they're still better athletes 
than almost every single person that ends up talking about them. So does that annoy you at all? No, because they're still usually very smart also because Ivy League doesn't give out scholarships. So the guys who play sure. for the for the sports there in the Ivies, while they might still be, you know, maybe they're not as intelligent as maybe some of the other people on campus there, they're still very smart because in order to, <laughs> to even get in there, you have to have certain grades. Same oh, yeah. thing. Michigan, Standard's Notre wild. Dame, one of the things that holds them back at times, Stanford. No, oh, Michigan just won the national championship. Right, but what I'm saying, sometimes what, what holds them you, back is they, I get they the do point have academic standards mm-hmm. that some other programs might not adhere to, and Ivy Leagues take that even another level up. So I'm okay with that. Yeah, I mean, listen, the Ivies are smart people, right? People talk about it at Duke all the time. There's a lot of smart kids at very smart schools. So, you know, why not? Because what happens is when we talk about that and then they win and have a big upset, it makes it more fun. Now, also, when it comes to brackets, are you filling out a bracket? Just wondering. I mean, I always do, but I, I honestly couldn't tell you. Like, I'm going to be like my girlfriend 15 years ago who filled it out based off of the colors or the names of the mascots. I'm going to basically fill it out based on, like, gut feeling. But I, don't, I couldn't tell you who the starting point guard is for, like, number eight in the West Regional. I have no idea. Now, is, is that girlfriend of 15 years ago now your wife? Or is that a different girl? No, I'm just I'm using the hypothetical oh, okay. where, you know, like guys, girlfriends who win brackets because they picked, you know, team oh, colors. that team has purple. And then they went to the final four randomly. Yeah. So I'll never forget fifth grade. We were allowed to do a bracket. Now I feel like you would get canceled if you promoted any gambling or brackets in, in the fifth grade. But we did a bracket in fifth grade and all the guys, we all thought we were going to win. Right. We all know things about sports. Dara Faye Lilling. I still remember the girl's name. In fifth grade, she won the bracket, and she sat across from me in class. Like, you have, like, four little tables, and they, like, throw them all around the room and everything. Uh, She was one of the people that sat next to me in our quadrant, and she, I remember her. She was picking the bracket based off the team colors, and she ended up winning the bracket. I also find it funny when we're here at a sports talk radio network, and we have a legendary sports talk radio station down the hall. It's always someone random. Who wins the bracket? It's never one of the hosts. It's never one of the producers. It's always like the salesperson's wife's friends, daughters, like plumber. It's it's never or or accountant. It is never someone associated with sports. So I get asked to do a lot of these brackets. Um, I'm doing Maggie and Perloff's bracket. I actually got asked by DA. You better represent the show and beat every one of them. Because Maggie and Andrew, I've been with them for a couple years with brackets, and they did not do very well. Well, I've done their bracket before. Uh, DA actually texted me the other day. He want Our old pal, Damon Amendolore, he wants me to do his bracket. If I win, I get a bottle of bourbon. But I guess it's outside of, like, people that used to either work with him now or worked here at CBS Sports Radio. The loser has to eat toxic sludge. Now, I don't know what that is, but I can't afford to lose. Like, I don't need to win. I just can't lose because I don't want to have to eat toxic sludge. How many people are in the bracket? Um, I'm not sure. It's like a sour. It's the most sour candy in the world, DA was telling me. And for some reason, I read that and I said, yeah, why not? I'll do it. All right. uh, I'm in the CBS Sports Radio FAN friends and family bracket. And then someone that I know also asked me to join their bracket. So I'm in like four or five brackets. The point I'm getting to. Let's say you were in four or five brackets as well, Santer. How many brackets you actually filling out? Like, do you do a different one for all four or five of the the competitions or the tournaments that you're in? So if I'm in multiple and and some bracket challenges, you can like put in multiple brackets. Mm-hmm. I remember I used to run the Maggie and Perloff bracket, and you were allowed Michael to... Samter one, Michael Samter two, Michael Samter three. Correct. You Michael can put Samter in three four. different brackets. So if I'm in uh, a bracket that allows multiple brackets, obviously I'll have variations. But for the most part, I have one main bracket that I'll submit to all of my main groups, and then I'll have a secondary bracket that I kind of, okay, well, here's kind of a a different way to go. But usually I have one main bracket that I try not to deviate too much from, Uh, but uh, I I won't always necessarily have the exact same bracket in every single pool that I'm in. In the four or five that I entered, I fill out one bracket and one bracket only. I am a man of integrity. I understand people could say, no, you're a man of stupidity. It's odds. It's percentages. All of that. I'm a man of integrity. One bracket, one bracket only. Because here's what ha- what happens. I don't think many people care actually about your bracket that much. 
They just care if they win their league or not. But let's just say I had a great upset. And let's say I picked like a 13 seed to go to the final four of the Elite Eight. And and I'm posting that like, oh, look at me. I got the bracket pick right, blah, 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 blah. That means nothing to me if you have eight brackets. Because I would hope you'd be able to get one underdog right in all the chances that you played. But if you have one bracket, it's a true bracket that if it succeeds, great. And if it doesn't, oh, well, I'm not someone trying to be like a, I don't know, a fraudulent human being. Oh, I got all these picks right. Well, yeah, you had 45 damn brackets for crying out loud. You better be able to get one or two picks right. So that's my, my whole rant. One bracket. Sure, I get it. Uh, integrity could be a word that you use, but I'm going to go with the analytical look at it and just be like, listen, if you really want to win. What are you, like, an Ivy if, League nerd? No, it's like if you play the lottery, <laughs> you're going to play the same ticket 27 times? No, you're going to change the numbers up so you increase your odds. I am going to the shore this weekend to watch March Madness. I can't wait for some reason to play roulette. I don't know why. Roulette to me is like the anytime touchdown of football uh, gambling. That's the that's I love anytime touchdowns. I like roulette play. Well, hopefully, a you have better luck than you did in Vegas, and b you don't let either me or the dealer or the spinner uh, convince you what color yeah. or what number to go on because you had a plan going into it in Vegas, and then I wanted to boycott the plan when I got there, and you talked me back into going with the plan, and then I talked you into it, and then you lost, and then the dealer or the spinner, whatever the hell the roulette person is called, yeah. talked you back out of a different strategy that you had. And you lost every single time you played. So I ignored all of you. Well, I didn't ignore all of you there. But then when I went to Puerto Rico, you guys weren't there. So you weren't able to spam my uh, great brain. And I ended up winning a few hundred dollars. See, there you go. Never listen to anybody else. Follow your gut. But here was the problem I had with Puerto Rico at the roulette table. I looked at the board. Their board was broken. Because, like, I like playing red and black in roulette. And I don't know why I like just seeing how long I could ride that. And you, then you put some some chips in the middle, and that's where you try to win your big money. But when I went up to the board, I saw five red in a row. So I'm like, oh, I'm going to put like 100 on black. The problem was wheel did spin, and it landed on black, so I was good. And then the, the teller, the dealer, whatever it was, looks up at me, and they go, you know our board's broken. He waited until after he spun the machine. And I was clear, oh, it's five red. It's going to be black. I'll put it on black. He waited until after he spun the wheel for roulette to then tell me, oh, yeah, our board is broken. Well, you know, it's serendipitous. It was destiny for you to win. Yeah. But anyway, there's no skill to that stuff. Everyone thinks they're a whisperer when it comes to gambling, and then everyone well, nine no, roulette times, is specifically, nine Yeah, roulette is 100% a luck game. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, Bruce Pearl going to join us coming up in about 10 minutes. Did you see Brandon Ayuk's tweet yesterday? He tweeted, now this is a great strategy to try to get yourself out of one city and try to get you a trade and then get a contract. With Brandon Ayuk, it's clear, it feels like his time is coming to an end in San Francisco. Final year of the contract, bunch of trade speculation, and you can go about this one or two ways. There's trade speculation, you don't say anything, and inevitably you get traded or they ride you out for the year. Or you can play into the media monster you could play into the speculation and throw gasoline on the fire. And Brandon Ayuk elected to throw gasoline on the fire. He tweeted at Mike Tomlin. His uh, Twitter handle is at Coach Tomlin. They say in we twins, what do you think? Eyeball emoji. That's basically him saying, I want to play for your football team. You could use another wide receiver. And I could use a new home that's going to give me a fat contract extension. And I think Brandon Ayuk is looking at it. Okay, I also know the Steelers have a passionate fan base. And I also know that the Steelers have changed their philosophy a bit this offseason where they made a lot of moves that we didn't think they're going to make. Like, I look at the Pittsburgh Steelers. Why not give up a first-round pick for Brandon Ayuk and then give him a contract extension? Philadelphia, they made a trade a few years ago for A.J. Brown. They gave him the extension and it worked. And the Steelers are picking at 20th right now in the draft. Who are you, like, we sometimes overvalue draft picks. Like, for example, the Patriots need a wide receiver. I'm not saying trade the third overall pick for Brandon Ayuk. But the 20th pick in the draft, like, it's a deep wide receiver draft. I get it. And they're 
are obviously in any draft a lot of players that fall out of the first round that you could snag and turn into a star. But at the 20th pick in the draft, am I willing to sacrifice that for a known commodity in Brandon Ayuk, who, let me say this, is a better wide receiver than Debo Samuel. Not a better overall player, but a better wide receiver than Debo Samuel on his same team. Yeah, I would trade the 20th pick for Brandon Ayuk. Brandon Ayuk this past year had over 1,300 yards receiving, 75 receptions. The Eagles just did it with A.J. Brown. And Tennessee didn't want to pay A.J. Brown, and it ended up ruining, it won't ruin the San Francisco 49ers, but that A.J. Brown trade was the beginning of the end to that run that Tennessee did have. So the Steelers, they should pick up the phone. Brandon Ayuk is sending out the Batman signal right now. They should pick up the call. They should get a deal done with the San Francisco 49ers. Let me ask you this, though, Mike, because the Niners recently went through what appeared to be a contentious relationship with Debo Samuel. It didn't feel like Debo was going to get the contract extension. Then they got the contract extension with Debo Samuel. Could they pay Brandon Ayuk and then trade Debo Samuel? Like, you got to make a decision here. It's either Ayuk or it's Debo Samuel. And even though Debo is such an explosive player and he's a versatile player, I think having Christian McCaffrey as your running back Like, if you didn't have McCaffrey, it makes the importance of Debo larger. Now, I'm not saying that Debo's not a great player. Debo's a a really damn good player. We know that. But having McCaffrey, I actually think then having the better wide receiving option is more important than the overall player. So I would actually argue that the Niners should trade Debo and they should pay uh, pay Brandon Ayuk, but I don't think they're going to do that. I think with now with the way that I, it's going to go one or two ways. Ayuk will get traded at the draft and will get a long-term extension somewhere else, or they're just going to say, we're okay with the messy situation. We'll let this situation be messy because we have a team that's primed to win a Super Bowl, and we don't think Brandon Ayuk is going to sit out games that are actually important, which ends up coming into being the postseason. So where, where are you at on the whole Ayuk Debo thing, if it's one or the other? No, I, I think that if you have to make the move, you you move on Ayuk because it's easier to find a star receiver than it is to find a guy like Debo who can do things that basically nobody else in the NFL could do. There's maybe one or two other guys who could do what Ayuk, uh, what, what Debo does, mm-hmm. and there's a dozen other guys or more that can do what Ayuk does. Maybe not as well, but, I mean, Ayuk is a very good player, but there's so many good receivers, and there's three guys in the top ten this year that could be as good, if not better, than Ayuk anyway. And here's the other question. the With how loaded that offense is, how much does it inflate the stats of Brandon Ayuk? Now, Ayuk was a first-round receiver. Similar to Purdy. But you just wa- – yeah, sure. Um, but you just wonder, with having a McCaffrey, having a Debo, having Kittle, how much does that – maybe make Ayuk look like he is a better player than what he actually is. That's something that's fair, but we've had that question be thrown out there before with players and they go to other spots and we've had overloads right at the wide receiving position or jog land. Uh, what, what's the word that I'm trying Log jam. Log jam. Uh, sorry. At the, at the wide receiver position. I like jog lambs. Yeah. It's, it sounds like I'm about to go on a, uh, on a jog and eat, eat lamb, which would, re- wouldn't really be probably. Ooh, uh, you just imagine helpful. that. Just like, you know, yeah. working up a sweat, <laughs> chowing on a lamb, you know, with a little mint sauce yeah. as you dip it in. Oh, geez. I had, mm. on one of the bachelor parties I went to, they, we had a chef and they made uh, lamb chops and they put pesto on the oh, lamb chops. Yeah. Oh, delicious. mouth is watering. Absolutely delicious. Oh, yeah. But um, what I was saying is we've seen it before, right? People wonder what Anquan Bolden was going to be when you had Larry Fitzgerald in that same wide receiver room. Anquan Bolden went on to be a phenomenal wide receiver. Um, it's also gone the other way where Antonio Brown, Juju Smith-Schuster, then when they got separated, didn't end up being that Juju Smith-Schuster was, was as great. So we've seen it before. Like um, the Patriots were able to identify Wes Welker. Wes Welker was like a 500-yard receiver in Miami. Then he goes to New England. You put Randy Moss next to him, and he turns out to be – you know, way, way over a thousand yard receiver. So we've seen that happen before. I still think Ayuk could go pretty much anywhere and be a thousand yard wide receiver. But just being a thousand yard wide receiver isn't much. But a 12, 1300 yard wide receiver, I still think he could be a number one wide receiver on uh, uh, more than a handful of teams in this league. And I'll make this quick because we have Bruce Pearl coming up. But you put him with George Pickens and Russ or Justin Fields with that run game in Pittsburgh and that defense. I'm not saying Super Steelers Bowl. Need to do it. Th- I mean that that's a team. Well, that's that, a Super Bowl team. 
It depends on what Russ and or Fields can be, but they have everything else except for the question mark Bengals around better. quarterback. Yes, at most other positions, especially a quarterback, but there's enough talent, especially in that defense for Pittsburgh, that if the quarterback does work out, Russ or Fields, mm-hmm. that's a team that can contend for that division title and make some noise in the playoffs. The last thing I'll say about the Steelers, the Steelers have told you they need to change this offseason. So they got rid of Kenny Pickett. They brought in Russell Wilson. Then they also added Justin Fields. That was a positive move. Just that, though, doesn't really change that much drastically the the big picture with your franchise. Like, still, Apex, the Steelers are a wild card team. Maybe they could win their first playoff game since the 2016 season. You go get Ayuk, though, and you team him up with Pickens, and like Santer's saying, you hit on either Wilson or Fields with that defense, man, that's the Steelers just changing what they're doing and showing they're a little bit more serious about winning than what they have been the last few years. Zach Gelb shows CBS Sports Radio. Bruce Pearl, SEC Tournament Champions once again at Auburn. He'll join us next as the Auburn Tigers get set for another NCAA tournament run. You're in a five-minute break.
We continue. It is the Zach Gelb Show, coast to coast on CBS Sports Radio. Growing up as a kid on Long Island, whenever I would go to the Suffolk Y JCC, I would always see photos of Bruce Pearl because the Suffolk Y JCC, which is my gym, is also home to the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. And I know Coach Pearl is a proud inductee of the Jewish Sports Hall of Fame. He's also a sensational basketball coach, Auburn SEC tournament champions. And now they're off to the big dance. Once again, they have it rolling as a four seed in Spokane, Washington, going up against Yale coming up Friday afternoon. And now joining us on the Zach Gelb Show is Coach Pearl. Coach, always great to see you. Congrats on all the success and how you been? Zach, been great. Been great. Thank you. And uh, very excited and very blessed to, to still be playing uh, in March Madness and uh, excited about the opportunity to play Yale on Friday. So it was such a fun moment for your program to win the SEC tournament. And in that moment, we just saw the genuine emotion that you had remembering your father, who unfortunately passed away in August. I, I thought it was a sad, a beautiful, and a neat moment, just kind of reflect on what you were experiencing after winning another SEC tournament. You know, Zach, I think it's something that every, every, all of us can relate to. I think when they saw my emotions, it, 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 it touched everybody because everybody's had that happen at different times. And they know that I just wish that he could have been there in person. So I could have watched him enjoy and, and, and laugh and cry and, and hug him. Uh, but my faith is strong and so is his. So I know, I know very well that he was present and, you know, your family, is your team and your family is your coaching staff. And of course my family was all there as well. And so I wasn't the only one that lost my dad. My staff knew my dad really well. He used to walk around telling me he was the real BP. He was the real head coach at Auburn. Right. And uh, when he did, when he died, he, before he, when he was getting closer, he, he asked me, he said, do you think the Auburn fans be okay if, if uh, I wore my Auburn basketball shirt, uh, you know, when they laid me to rest. And my dad went to Northeastern. He wasn't a Southern guy, you know. I said, Daddy, I, I think they'd, they'd be honored. So it was it was a moment and it, great, great to win the championship and, and uh, especially so good. And now we're, you know, we're still, we're still playing. I know your players are your family. And then you also have your son who you coached and has been on your staff since you got there at Auburn. I know it's a different relationship when you're coaching your son, but to be able to coach aside your son and to see him rising in this sport, just as a dad, that has to be the ultimate honor and joy, right? Oh, it's unbelievable. I mean, I've been so blessed to have, you know, Stephen uh, with me his whole life, right? But now that he's a young man and got a beautiful wife and, and uh, Brittany and a wonderful family, um, to be able to share in this uh, work and this ministry, is is uh, even more special, and uh, yeah, he's he does a phenomenal job. He's one of the top assistants in college basketball, and um, it's awfully fun, to, you know, uh, doing this doing this together. We all know Bruce Pearl. You want to be successful when you get a job like this. You've had success at Auburn, but more importantly, you've had sustained success to win that SEC tournament championship once again. Just what does it mean, and what does it say about the state of the Auburn Tigers basketball program? Well, you know, Zach, it's it's not a time to reflect because we're in the middle of it right now. Um, you know, but we have won four championships with four different teams in the last seven years, and 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 I'm very proud of that. I am. Uh, the the reason why this team has been so successful, they're talented, they like each other, uh, they they play well together, they've improved throughout the season. Uh, this, uh, I think, uh, ourselves and maybe Iowa State were two teams that weren't picked in the top twenty five, or certainly you know, not the top 10 and both of us find ourselves there. And when you are able to do it in a year when you're not supposed to do it, we're picked sixth or seventh in the SEC and we wind up you know, being able to win the championship tied for second in the regular season. It tells you how hard the guys have worked, how far they've come in the position that we put ourselves in right now. How did your team specifically do that to exceed the expectations this year? I think, I think bought into the fact that we had to go um, our only chance to beat Yale, who plays, who's got such a, a veteran team, such a smart team, such a dangerous team from three. They 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 run beautiful offense. Uh, they don't get rattled. They they led Kansas at Kansas for 30 minutes early in the season. They had a, a, a double digit lead over Gonzaga here in Spokane during the season. And 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 one of the Ivy League were really good teams in the Ivy League. And the Ivy League has got a history of coming in the tournament and upsetting people. Like look last year with Princeton beating yeah. number two Arizona. Um, so 
Uh, we got to guard. We got to guard without fouling. We got to try to disruptive, but but not you know, uh, not be impatient. And then you better take you better take advantage. What what Yale doesn't get enough credit for? They were the best defensive team in the Ivy League, and so the reason why they're so I think they're like three hundred twenty eight in pace is because they make you take time to get good looks. You're you're not gonna just go down there against all five is back and get something easy. They're not gonna beat themselves. So we recognize that. We understand that. Um, it's hard to run through the SEC and play anybody that looks anything like them. Um, and so it's going to wind up that can we adjust to a game that will be played at a different pace? Um, that's going to be the real key. Coach Bruce Pearl here with us. His team tips off the NCAA tournament on Friday up against Yale. Sometimes when you win a conference tournament and then everyone's praising you, people wonder if you're going to overlook the opponent. I could already tell by the way that you have been – kind of talking about Yale, that's not a concern with, with your program going from the high of winning the SEC and then getting a, a 413 matchup. No, I, I, we won't overlook them, um, you know, but we've got to be able to be excited about playing them um, and 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 we'll we'll try to show them uh, where by, by having great effort and energy and great focus, you can be effective and we'll try to show them, look, here's, here's sit some situations with against really good teams that they didn't take them real seriously. And, and it'll make you look bad. So, you know, when you're still dealing with young people. Our guys should have celebrated Sunday night and even Monday and into Monday. And you don't, you can't help but waking up, recognizing that you're a champion and feel good about it. At the same time, you work all year life, well, all year long. Well, you work your whole life to put yourself in position to get in these tournaments and be able to advance. And so, uh, you know, yeah, we will, we'll, we respect our opponent and, uh, we got, but we got to do more than just respect them. You know, we actually got to go beat them. I know you probably don't need more motivation this time of the year, but when you win the SEC, I would think you guys would be better than a four seed. Did that message when you guys got the four seed kind of provide maybe a little extra motivation to your squad? I mean, the guys talked about it a little bit. They wanted to know why we ranked seventh in the country or fifth in Ken Palm or fourth on this or and everything like that. And you can use that. But the bottom line is you got to beat great teams to get there anyways. So, you know, my big thing is why are we all out here in Spokane, Washington? And this is a beautiful place. And uh, we're so excited about being here and everything. But we can get there because the NAA will fly us here and you get treated really, really well. So we're grateful. Um, but our fans can't get here. Uh, our parents can't get here as easily. Um, and and for that, I I just don't think it doesn't make doesn't make a lot of you, you know, University of Alabama, UAB, uh, University of Alabama, and Auburn are all in Spokane, Washington, playing in this tournament. It's not fair to our families and our fans. Wrapping up with Coach Bruce Pearl, his team back in the NCAA tournament, their SEC tournament champions. They play Yale coming up on Friday. Jedi Broom, I know we've talked about him in the past, but to get him into the program two years ago, coming over to Morehead State to see what he's been able to give you. Now, yesterday named a third-team All-American. Just how about his growth during your time and your relationship with him? You know, Zach, he's checked every box. You know, he had to go to mid-major uh, Division One because he wasn't that highly thought of, wasn't a good enough athlete, wasn't this or wasn't that. All he does is go to Morehead State, get really coached, uh, become an all-conference player there. And then because as the opportunity to maybe transfer up, can I can I do it in the SEC? Well, let's see. Well, he does it. He go, last year he was a, a, an all conference SEC player. You know, we led by ten uh, in, in in the second round against uh, maybe the second best team in the country, the Houston Cougars, and he had a lot to do with that. Um, so we checked some boxes last year. He decides to come back for his senior year with the goal of being an All American and, and winning a championship, and he and he accomplished both of those things. Um, and so, uh, you know. He uh, he's done great, and I think it's an example of of you know the hard work and, and belief in himself and 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 growth and also recognition that when we as a team are successful, you know you as an individual will be more successful than if you as an individual are successful but the team fails. You know part of the reason why he's an All American, part of the reason why we won is because he's he's carried us, but part of the reason why he's an All American is because this team is is ranked seventh in the country. You look at, at this team, you guys play your, your butts off defensively, and you guys rotate in a lot of players, 10 players with double-digit uh, minutes per game. Uh, it looks like this is a team with no ego. It looks like this is a team that's selfless. Is that a fair read of your program, and how do you get your players to buy in when you're rotating their minutes so much? That's certainly the, and that's certainly the way you try and play. Um, and yet, because 
because the guys work so hard. They've all got to accept left. I got two point guards that are playing 20. They want to play 30. It's not a 60 minute game. I've got, I got Denver Jones out there that, you know, could be, he could be the one of the best guards in the league, but he only plays 23 or 24 minutes. Katie Johnson would rather start to come off the bench. I mean, you know, there's, and you just go up and down the roster. Dylan Cardwell is a center uh, at Cheney Johnson as a power forward. Those two guys are backing up two all conference players. You don't hear a word for them. They just, they just, they write, they ready when they go in there. They do play selflessly. And, uh, but when they do get out there on the floor, uh, we don't drop off. We just get different. And so, yeah, this team, the strength of this team is the sum of its parts. Uh, and that's true with our coaching staff, too. You know, we've got great, we've got, you know, I get head coaches get a lot more credit than we deserve when we're winning. Sometimes we get a little bit more, too much of the blame when we're losing. But I've got, I've got a, as good a staff as there is in college basketball. And it's been proven. My guys have stayed together over the years, and 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 so I'm I'm very blessed and very grateful. The sports changing with NIL and with the transfer portal. We've seen coaches that have been around a long time. Sometimes that expedites their retirement process. How much love do you still have for for what you do, and do you at all think about when you're going to walk away from coaching? You know, Zach. As long as I can stay healthy, and uh, that's a challenge uh, because of the pace uh, that you have to you know that that you have to work with. Um, you know, it's 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 uh, it, it, it's an everyday deal, um, but that's what happens in this ministry. The kids deserve it. The university deserves it. The way we're compensated, you have got to. Uh, and 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 what's on the line, obviously. So no, I, I I'll do this as long as I can do it well, and as long as I can stay healthy, and as long as Auburn wants me to. Well, we know you're doing a heck of a job. I don't see why they wouldn't want to keep you around for as long as possible. He is Bruce Pearl. His team won the SEC once again. They have Yale coming up on Friday. Coach, always great to connect with you and see you. Thanks so much for doing this. Great to be with you again, Zach. It's always great to be with you at this time of the year. War Eagle. War Eagle. There we go. Bruce Pearl joining us on the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. I always love when college coaches come on and then at the end of the conversation they always do whatever their chant or whatever their school saying is. So I thought Coach was about to not say War Eagle. That would have ruined my day. But the fact that he did say War Eagle and that's not me saying, like, oh, I love Auburn or something like that. And then Alabama fans are going to start saying, no, you should be saying roll time. I always do love when a coach says whatever their school saying is at the end of uh, conversations. I don't know why they do it, but I always find it to be uh, always somewhat funny and, and entertaining and something that I always enjoy. And, hey, Russ Wilson took it to the NFL. Yeah, that one didn't work. Let's ride, baby. Broncos country. Let's ride. What's Broncos the new one country. for the Steelers now? Oh, it's uh, here we go. Because that's like that song. Here we go. Mm, 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 mm. Here we go. Mm, 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 mm. Here we go. Mm, 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 mm. Pittsburgh Steelers Super Bowl. It's whatever that dumb chant is. But that's what uh, Russell Wilson uh, is now saying. Ugh, if he starts, if he starts doing the "Here we go" chant all the time, that will be insufferable. But if he was a college coach, I think I would actually like it. Anyway, we'll come on back. We'll wrap up shop. This is Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. Update time. Here we go. It's Rich Ackerman. CBS Sports Radio. Sports Flash. Where are we going? Two more teams will try to get to the field Bermuda. of 64. That's good. I'll take that. All right. See ya. you. Somebody else will do the rest of this update. <laughs> <laughs> the evening starts at the Grambling, meeting Montana State, and the winner advancing to face Purdue. The second part of the doubleheader features Colorado and Boise State. The Buffaloes coming off a 24-win season. Head coach Tad Boyle said, it is never easy to get to this point, so appreciate it. We're excited to be here, obviously. I mean, to, to get to this tournament, to get to this stage is... Uh, is a process for every team, and uh, every team has its uh, ups and downs throughout the season. We've had a lot of them. Uh, a lot of ours had to do with injury. They had one eight straight before a loss in the Pac-12 tournament. The winner will meet Florida next. The Celtics look to extend their winning streak to seven when they host the Bucks. While the Thunder try to take over sole possession of the Western Conference lead, they host the Jazz and currently tied with idle Denver for the top spot in the Western Conference. And the Dodgers beat the Padres 5-2 in South Korea with Shohei Otani collecting two hits in his Dodger debut as well as an RBI and a stolen base. I'm Rich Eckham. Follow us anytime on Twitter. Our handle is at CBS Sports Radio.
You're in a five minute break. Four minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Four minutes remaining. Three minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Three minutes remaining. Two minutes, 30 seconds remaining. Two minutes remaining. One minute, 30 seconds remaining. One minute remaining. Forty five seconds remaining. Thirty seconds remaining. Fifteen seconds. Break ends in five seconds.
Hey, this is Howie. And this is Nick. From We're the Factory, Factory Boys. Boys. And you're listening to the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. And guess what? Zach is back. All right. He's live. He's nationwide on CBS Sports Radio. This is the Zach Gelb Show. Oh, my God. We're back again. Wow. It is the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. How about this story? Mike Mazzeo um, is saying, according to the L.A. Times, Shohei Otani has now fired his interpreter, and the interpreter is accused of stealing millions of dollars from the L.A. Dodgers star in order to make bets with an alleged illegal bookmaker. So this is a developing story here. I thought the only thing to come out of the Shohei Otani camp today is that the Dodgers season started, and no one knew the season actually started up against the Padres. But there is a story in the LA Times that is just breaking, and this is from a Los Angeles Times investigative reporter, Nathan Fenno, and the headline is Shohei Otani's attorney accuses interpreter of massive theft tied to alleged gambling. I have no more information other than that. It literally, when I came back from break, I saw it on my timeline. I made sure that it was from a verified publication. But representatives of Dodger star Shohei Otani on Wednesday accused his interpreter of engaging in a massive theft, according to the LA Times, of the ball player's funds to place bets with an alleged legal bookmaker who is the target of a federal investigation. Lawyers for Otani made that claim after the Times learned that Otani's name had surfaced in the investigation of Matthew Boyer, an Orange County resident. Otani's representatives looked into the actions of the interpreter, and in a response to the Times uh, inquiries, a source close to the matter said two sources told the newspaper that the money involved was in the millions of dollars. So that's all that I have right now. We we don't know any of the details of the story. Yeah, let me let me just preface that. I literally yes. just read that headline yes. thirty seconds coming back from break. I just read I, the, I read you that excerpt from yes. the article, the first two paragraphs. Right. The, anything we are about to say, we are we are giving you hot takes here. This is not yes. well researched on this. Yet. Well, this isn't hot take per se. This is just potential behind the scenes. Who knows? We know this is what we know so far is that this is what's being alleged by Otani's camp. That the interpreter stole money and bet it. Is this maybe getting in front of a story if it's something Could this else? Be, I mean, listen. Otani's name was found when investigating this illegal bookie. We don't know. Well, what was but he could there be on? a chance That's the that big Otani... Question. Yeah, could there be a chance that Otani was putting down bets? I don't know. And, and I'm not going to speculate on that. But I think the biggest thing from this story, and all we know is it is a massive theft tied to alleged gambling. What are you gambling on? Because if you're gambling on baseball games, then what information did you know or what did Otani know? And again, the LA Times contacted Otani because they saw his name connected with this illegal bookie. It's Otani's camp that's saying it was the interpreter who did this. So until we see any evidence or until there's more evidence that comes out that it was, in fact, the interpreter doing this, there's still questions. Mm-hmm. What did the interpreter know? Well, <laughs> did he get any information from Otani? Could Otani be embroiled in this? Or is Otani completely innocent? Or could it be Otani was maybe more involved he, and they're putting the blame on the on the interpreter as the scapegoat? Here's why I don't think Otani was placing the bets. You're really going to use your own name? Like, this isn't a college kid. This is mega superstar, international icon, Shohei Otani. So, something doesn't add up in this story. Because if Otani's actually using his name, that's really dumb. The interpreter using Otani's name, that doesn't incriminate yourself. But why would you use the most well, this popular is, player this is in the an sports illegal bookie. name? He's not like on an app, you know, signing in on an app mm-hmm. on his name. This is an illegal bookie who probably... The way sure. a lot of these illegal bookies work is they make relationships with people Understood. and then they just take bets. So maybe this illegal bookie. How do you know about the illegal bookie game? 
Uh, listen, I live in New York. Back I, in the day, know, you know. Listen, uh, went to school in Boston uh, and Arizona okay. State. They had their had their mm-hmm. thing a couple of years back. You know, all this. I, I'm just, I understand that it's right. a, an illegal bookie, but I'm just I'm just saying. Right. No, but what I'm saying is that the how does the bookie, actual name get out there? Well, so the 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 bookie knows the people. He has personal relationships with the people who are yes. placing the bets. So even if Otani wanted to use a personal name, a fake name to place the bets, the bookie knows who's placing the bets. And the bookie probably got tied up in something else. And the and now bookie probably has records of the people that he's placing bets for. And while he's probably placing, bet, placing bets for these people under fake names, his records show who they really are. And when he's being investigated by the FBI, the actual names of the actual people come out. Now, again... We don't know if Otani's involved at all. It could be exactly what Otani's camp is saying, that it's just this interpreter. If that's the case, there's still questions about maybe what the interpreter may have known. But if Otani is somehow involved in this, and the way we know how baseball treats gambling, this... This is a huge development. You got to reinstate Pete Rose and oh, get him in the Hall of Fame goodness. if Otani is gambling on games. You know, here's the funny thing: <laughs> they they would probably reinstate Pete Rose to keep Otani around before they would get rid of Otani. By the way, is this turning into a show tomorrow? Eight five five two one two four CBS. Should the Baseball Hall of Fame Cooperstown put Pete Rose in? Give us a call. That's what it's going to turn into. By the way, we have more breaking news from Jeff Goodman. This has nothing to do with any scandals. This has nothing to do with any gambling. But, ah, but uh, Scandals are more fun. But Baylor Scott Drew dun, dun, will remain at Baylor, sources told the field of 68. Drew obviously has been a top target of Louisville and other schools. So Scott Drew, as I said on this show, you try to call Scott Drew and you try to get him to go to Louisville, but he's not going to go to Louisville. He's going to use that with Baylor and drive up his price. So maybe it's going to be Dusty May or, or Pat Kelsey that ends up getting the Louisville job. Anyway, it's time to answer Ask the Pros question of the day. It's brought to you by O'Reilly Auto Parts. And our question comes from Jim in Louisiana who says, Zach, what do you make about Marvin Harrison Jr. not uh, participating in drills in the Ohio State Pro Day? You can submit a question by tweeting at CBS Sports Radio at Zach Elbies and the hashtag Ask the Pros. Think O'Reilly Auto Parts where your car care needs get guaranteed low prices and excellent customer service from the professional parts people at O'Reilly Auto Parts. Oh, 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 O'Reilly Auto Parts. I don't give a rat's ass that Marvin Harrison Jr. didn't participate in drills at the NFL Combine. He didn't participate in drills today at the Ohio State Pro Day. I will make this very clear. Marvin Harrison Jr. is the best wide receiver in this draft. And not only is he the best wide receiver in the draft, he is the best pound-for-pound player in this draft. I have seen enough of Marvin Harrison Jr. on the field, playing in games to know what type of football player he is going to be. I don't need to see him in shorts and a t-shirt run a 40 time or catch passes. Go watch him play with Kyle McCord, who was not that good. He kept Ohio State in a lot of games and won a lot of games last year for Ohio State that they should not have won. The dude is a stud. The dude comes from football royalty with who his dad was. If Marvin Harrison Jr. is not a Hall of Famer one day, I will be surprised. I really do believe he's the best player in this draft. And I understand that the quarterbacks are going to go probably one, two, three, and maybe even one, two, three, four. But the first non-quarterback in this draft should absolutely be Marvin Harrison Jr. getting selected. And anyone that's now saying... Oh, he's egotistical. Oh, the arrogance of Marvin Harrison Jr. How dare he think he's above the combine and above his pro day? Stop. Because you're one of those losers that all you do is value the 40 times and the bench press reps and all that nonsense and all that hogwash. Watch the games. Marvin Harrison Jr. knows he doesn't have to do any of that stuff. Because he's that damn great. And I don't use that word great easily. That's what I see when I watch Marvin Harrison Jr. greatness. And heck, I'm a Michigan fan. So I I should have no reason to like him. But the dude is a stud. An absolute stud. And I actually regret not putting him third on my Heisman ballot this year. I went quarterback, quarterback, quarterback. Um, You know, with Jaden Daniels going one. Then uh, Michael Penix Jr. two. And I had Bo Nix three. I should have put Marvin Harrison Jr. in at three. That's how much respect I have 
for the player that Marvin Harrison Jr. is. All righty. That will conclude the Zach Gelb Show on CBS Sports Radio. Big thanks to Samter. Big thanks to Ryan Botcher, the entire crew, and uh, each and every one of you for tuning in, calling, listening, tweeting, interacting with us on the YouTube.com slash CBS Sports Radio chat. You can always give us a call, 855-212-4CBS, 855-212-4227, and follow me, Instagram, Twitter, at Zach Gale. Big thanks to Kyle Whittingham. Big thanks to Seth Greenberg. Big thanks to Bruce Pearl for stopping by. March Madness is here. And I know people will say, oh, the play-in tournament game. No, tomorrow it is here. The actual start of the NCAA tournament. And I can't wait. We'll talk to you at 3 p.m. Eastern, noon Pacific, on a very busy Thursday edition of the Zach Gilb Show Extravaganza Manana. All righty, we out. Bye-bye. Peace.